What's going on, everybody? Cali Death Podcast back once again, episode 42. As always, I'm your host, Anthony, here with my other co host, resident homies, friends, best friends, all these. I love these guys, Joel, Joseph, and Casey. Every week they're here with me, backing me up, making sure nobody's trying to attack me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for coming out again, once, you know, every week, seeing the number, the views, you know. I love that there's people out there that still want to see this shit. That's why we're doing it every week. Um, tell a friend if you think that that friend would fucking want to be in on this shit. I don't know what we're going to call these people. We need to start calling our, our fans something. What? Tell, Hit us up tell. and see. It, give us some ideas. What were you going to say, John? I was going to try to make something up stupid. But anyways, we're bringing up Spotify. We're on Spotify now because we did yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the episode last time. All the people who don't know that use Spotify, we are on Spotify now. I don't think there's any other freaking place that we need to be. Is there other places that we need to be? Another thing you need to hit us up about. Um, as long as it doesn't cost us money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, fuck yeah, guys. All right. We got a new guest, a past guest coming back. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have both of them. Uh, our new guest this week is Lindsay O'Connor. And our past guest coming back is Mike DeSalvo. Both of you guys have a huge list of projects that you guys have done why don't you rattle them off first uh ladies first Lindsay. hello um well i am Lindsay, and i'm in a shit ton of projects one of which of course is coma cluster void with mike um and then i also do vocals in a band called eyes or tradition uh, we're a slam dummy slam <laughs> band out of las vegas <laughs> Um, and I, uh, also do like some solo electronica stuff on the side. And then I just launched a grind for project called hail the invisibles with my friend Lucas, uh, who does Mastro down in Argentina. So we're just putting that out in the next couple of months here. Vocals on that one as well. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Killer dude. And what's up with you, Mike? Well, same thing. CCV, Coma Cluster Void. Uh, I'm still uh, with uh, Curian. I've uh, got another project coming out, uh, Uncle Stalin and the Communist Joy. And uh, I'm re-releasing old demo. It's already actually it's done. Uh, re-releasing old demos from 92 and 94 with my band Infestation. So, yeah, I saw that. Actually, you did uh, it in cassette form, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, cassette and CD. Oh, and nice. The whole two, deal. Two types of cassettes, too. It's the original uh, cassettes like a, re a reissue of the original cassettes and then the compilation of them together, the antecedent as a, uh, as a CD and uh, cassette as well. So fuck, super stoked. Killer. Is that a uh, DIY? You got some, a label putting it out for you. Well, it's redefining darkness uh, is putting out one of the, is putting out the reissues of the, of the cassettes and the CD uh, in conjunction with um, Roscoe, uh, Roscoe's records and Intuit records. Uh, who are putting out the, uh, the, the cassettes and the, and the CDs as well. So yeah, it's a combination of people putting it together. It's really awesome. It's uh, tumbling. Fuck you know? yeah. Sick. No, that's super cool, dude. I'd love for somebody to do that with the carnivorous stuff. That'd be awesome to have it, somebody put out it, your demos. Honestly, they, there, are, there are people who, who are doing this right now and they do it well. And uh, I, I would encourage you to. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so Sever did it. Uh, shout out to Murray, by the way. I got a new fresh Mersey going with the Sever logo on the side here, right there. Uh, dude, real quick, I got to do a side note because Murray freaked me out. He sent me a link to uh, Jeremiah Watkins, who is a, a musician on the Kill Tony podcast, and Stevie Weeby, who is Bobby Lee's uh, younger brother. They do a podcast called Scissor Bros, and he sent me a link. And they're fucking wearing Merseys, dude. Murray sent them fucking the basketball. Holy merch. shit. What? So now, dude, their newest live thing that was like in an apartment or some shit. They're performing with that with Scissor Bros basketball Merseys, dude. Way cool. Mm. Shout out to Murray fucking fitting us all up. Now he's moving into the fucking comedy world. Yeah, man. That's dude. Yeah, he's Murray's throwing awesome. fucking dude, mad. Send money at it, that keep shit. sending him through the <laughs> comedy world and then we'll get a death metal versus dom uh comedy fucking basketball domination going, dude. <laughs> get a basketball team full of death metal heads and comedians. Yeah, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We would crush him. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> All right. Fuck yeah. So uh, did I just cut anybody off? What were you about to say, Joel? Sorry. Oh, sick. Uh, so, Mike, I'm just making something up right now because I had nothing to say. Oh, I thought, um, you were, so I thought I cut you off. My bad, dude. But yeah, dude. All right, let's get into this shit. Yeah, um, let's get into it. 
thank you again for everybody. We love you. Um, since Mike, you've already been on, obviously we're going to start with Lindsay first because I want to get her history. It always, it, it always um, fascinates me when I see a, a female who can do vocals better than me. <laughs> um, it really, it really, uh, it, it's just something that, that actually gets me more excited. Like a, a, I get a, a percentage higher excitement when I see a, a woman doing it and doing it good. So I, I want to uh, go back to the, as far as you want to take us, like, how you got into metal and, and how you decided you wanted to do it. You, the day you growled and you're like, Oh shit, that actually sounds kind of like what I'm listening to. And then you get further into that. I want to go down that path for sure. Start digging. All right. Well, uh, I was born on June 25th. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you. That's, those are high compliments. I appreciate that. Um, I, uh, growing up, I was, uh, I grew up in the nineties. So I was listening to a lot of like grunge music and stuff like that. So I always really had an appreciation for, you know, dissonance and just heavy, dark sounds. And, um, when I was probably maybe 15 or 16, something around that time, I actually, uh, kind of got, I was really into like the hardcore scene and just that kind of just, you know, really into that type of music. And, was really influenced by Black Flag, so the Henry Rollins era Black Flag. Um, but actually what got me into vocals specifically, I remember I got <laughs> the D. Snyder uh, Strangeland soundtrack. And, you know, because I, you know, all my favorite bands at the time were on there, like fucking Anthrax and Pantera. Mm -hmm. um, but there was this band on there called Crisis. And Crisis did a cover of Captain Howdy um and I was like who the fuck is this like because it, it was the first time I had ever heard a female vocalist doing any kind of really super aggressive metal style vocals um and I was like who the fuck is this so I went down every rabbit hole on AOL <laughs> and looking up this band crisis and I found death shed extermination the hollowing um, I think the hollowing was out at the time and I went back into death shed extermination and that's really what set me on my journey was Karen Crisis, Crisis the Band. I still like champion them as like the major influence for me musically and vocally. They were super dark, you know, just New York style, just heavy. And, you know, she was a super creative vocalist too. It wasn't always. Where were you growing up, by the way? I grew up in Michigan. So I grew up in like this little chilly hinterland town called Southfield. And uh, it was just kind of like, you know, you don't really have a lot of access to music. So a lot of the things I discovered was from like downloading shit on Napster and, you know, like yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I, but I was so into music. I did everything I could to, to just dig and find really interesting stuff. And Crisis was the first band, but interestingly enough, uh, what really got me kind of more into the brutal style stuff was uh, actually White Worms by Cryptopsy. That was the first Cryptopsy song I ever heard. It was obviously Mike on vocals. It was such a huge influence on me. I became a massive Cryptopsy fan after that. It was probably around the same age, 15, 16. And so then that just kind of like set me spinning, of course, even further down that road. Um, and then of course, when it came to actually doing the vocals, I just started kind of emulating what I heard. I didn't have any technique, didn't have any, you know, at the time nobody was doing YouTube videos on how to do fucking pig squeals. So mm -hmm. it was just like, emulate what you hear. And then when I moved to San Diego, I was about 17 and I started my first band and we were all purpose metal, all purpose heavy. So I kind of just leveraged what I had grown up with in the hardcore scene and through crisis and cryptopsy and bolt thrower and, you know, all these other bands I was listening to at the time. And I just kind of uh, amalgamated the sound. But as I got older, many, many years later, I just decided to kind of cultivate my own sound. You know, I think when you, when you're starting out, you kind of just emulate your favorite vocalists and you know but then when you really start to mature as a musician you find your own sound so I you know for where I, what I'm doing now it really is just what I feel is heavy for me I don't try to like emulate anybody but definitely um you know hearing that Captain Howdy cover many 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 years ago was what really set me on a journey awesome do you uh what was your AOL screening <laughs> <laughs> I cannot. Oh my god. All right. So we were talking about we were talking about new metal earlier before we started recording. So at the time I was a huge Slipknot fan. Nice. And I was a huge Kitty fan. 
So I put those two together and I think it was like slip kitty something like <laughs> with my like my birth date at the end or some fucking, you know, whatever. It was like, oh God. Slip kitty. Yeah. yeah it's, something that, it's something that I probably did too. I think we all did. If you were on AOL, you had some kind of ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mine was uh, Season the Obese from uh because i used to i love like sod and stuff when i was younger and and uh, they had a song that was like your this. that was like your email up until uh, like a couple that was in my ago, AOL. Probably. yeah yeah that was, that was it. like how i got a hold of you all the time <laughs> yeah. season the obese like email like okay joel blah, blah, blah. because like, your... my, my my first one was super dorky it was like a sports one it was like swiss shot three something like that. <laughs> like i was like a little kid so i was like you know in junior high school or something and then i was like you know it was actually, I remember back then it was like a big deal to change your screen name. It was like, dude, what am I, what am I going to do, dude? Like, what's it going to, where am I going with this? And I just, I don't know. I found that song title and just, it was history from there. I don't know. It's silly as fuck, but it definitely, it seems to be a bit. I know, I know. I was probably already, I mean, it's a, it's a SOD song making fun of Slayer. So I'm sure a bunch of people have that going for them. I, I actually, I actually have that uh, CD uh, uh, signed from the band. <laughs> Oh fuck! That's I don't even awesome, know how I got man. it. I never, yeah, I never met the guys. Like I met Dan, but I never met the rest of the guys. And, yeah, I, I, actually, we were uh, playing. Yeah, we played. That was probably the most scared I've ever been meeting someone. Was uh, we played Austin, Texas at Emos or something, and um, with suffocation, and I'm walking through the hall, and it's Terrence talking to, uh, fucking goddamn uh, Billy Milano, and I like randomly see him, and I'm just like all freaked out. I'm like. <laughs> I'm like starstruck because I know he's like a badass and he's kind of scary and he's like a shit talker and all the shit too and not the, and like and I was like dude I'm a huge fan I want I want you guys to fucking come back and do something he's like ah no nah, fuck Scotty and I sort started like cussing out about Scotty and shit and I was like I was just down, sitting there just like starry eyed you know that's like one of the only people that got me because that was like such an important band for me so and he's yeah he could beat me up so that's another thing he's a big dude I yeah. actually saw him in uh, uh, at uh, when they when they came back to play in. Um, uh, it was Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Festival. And I yeah. actually saw him at a bar. I was standing right there, right next to him. Uh, but I didn't talk. I didn't chat with him. Uh, but I, I did see him knock the f- knock Warhol Day the fuck out, man. Damn, he knocked him out. I don't. I don't know the full story of what the argument was about, but Warhol Dan was just like, "Fuck you, man! Don't you know?" And then the next thing you know, a flurry of punches, and he was out. And it was before they went on to play. Also, so like a half hour later, he went up to play and he was, he was talking about his jar. And then uh, fucking, I don't know if you guys have, I, I don't know if you're in, you know, of that age. I don't, I don't even know what year it was, but, uh, but uh, it was, I was right there and that's, I see the fucking clock and I was like, ooh. That yeah. sounds like a Billy Milano story if I've ever heard one for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody yeah. have a, a story about him where he, he was like super nice guy? I don't, you know, it's like, I've never heard anybody have a Billy. I mean, Milano he was story. nice to me. He was really nice, but oh, I was okay. still like new. Uh, his his uh, you know, his past preceded him. I was, I had you know that in my back of my head, and I've seen videos of him kicking people's asses and like <laughs> like fucking back flipping from like yeah. you know, twenty five feet up, and he's like three hundred pounds, like <laughs> off the <laughs> top, and just landing on the crowd and shit, and like the craziest shit I've ever seen. Is that guy? That guy is like the most thrash metal dude I've ever seen in my life. I don't know. Yeah. He, he also pulled out at that, at that show. He, um, they were selling SOD, uh, talk about uh, basketball jerseys. They were selling S- like fresh fucking SOD uh, jerseys. They were, fun. they were really nice. I, I don't I think they were selling for like 40 bucks back then. It was, it was expensive. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So he's, you know, they get on stage and he's like, yeah, I see all the shirts. I see you. Yeah. You guys like that shirt? Yeah. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, fuck. Yeah. We paid five bucks for those fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> the whole place went uh. so i think he's just like super honest dude he just has no it, you don't yeah, get any more it, honest than that yeah yeah no, that's a, that's a I, guess, I guess that's a good type of person you just know you're not going to get bullshit you know yeah. there even, is if, that. even if he's and an the, asshole at least it's the truth with slip kitty that you're talking about Lindsay. so the first uh when i was 14 i used to like run this little website when i was a kid but like i got to go backstage when i was 14 and the first band I ever got to see on stage was um, I was standing on stage with Kitty playing Ozfest, and I was like 13 or 14 years old. And I was just like, I was like, OK, I, I didn't really know about them yet. But I like stood on stage and I was like, holy, like the uh, what's her name? Morgan comes up. She's still like, like growls into the mic. <laughs> like she did a growl. And I was like, what the fuck is this? But yeah, now they uh, Kitty actually became pretty cool with us. We every time we played Toronto, they would just all come out and party with us like and I would just like 
fangirl over them just be like because they were like number one they were like had a number one hit for a while when they were like four, 15. 15 yeah yeah they were kids and like just living that life it's just a little side story that i'm just blabbing on but that was definitely fucking very impressive seeing them on stage when i was a little kid that was actually a, a huge moment yeah for me. i think they're they're our age now i mean i think they were yeah. our age then too so it was like your peers like just crushing it you know totally it's just super inspiring and they were i mean to this day i, I actually really admire that band because i think they were great songwriters if you actually just listen to their progression as a band throughout the years they mm -hmm. came out at a time when that sound was super popular but they just kept going and evolved and evolved and got heavier and really good musicians i've never met them but i've heard they're awesome human beings too yeah so. they're super sweethearts but yeah just yeah, being I had, I had their first two records they're dope yeah when oh, was, definitely when, you know when i was that was really the style that i was into i was like oh shit they're throwing down and it's a full female fucking roster you're like yeah. Dude, there's there was like a big percentage of bands that shouldn't even be mentioned that are all you know all male and just terrible in the <laughs> new metal realm and then you got kitty just showing them what's up you're like you guys remember that band uh drain sth from sweden say it again drain sth <sighs> does it's kind of maybe familiar. yeah that actually maybe that rings a bell now yeah they're kind okay. of doomy sludgy metal i think the lead singer martina or i don't know if that's really me one of them is married to tony yomi hmm. um oh wow <laughs> yeah like they were fucking they were super heavy i don't know that they really got the you know attention they deserve they did a couple of Ozfest tours mm -hmm. um but yeah you should go back and check them out because those first two albums they put out were like just super sludge metal Stockholm yeah. style, really good okay. shit. Did yeah. you ever listen to to Thor's Hammer with that one? Oh yes, wait, yeah. so, I forgot to mention Runehill. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a huge, uh, huge, huge, huge Thor's Hammer fan. I know they just put out that one album, mm -hmm. um, and Greg Anderson was in the band. That's like, okay. yeah. So, um, yeah. So like, fucking Runehill was a huge influence on me because I'd never heard a female do super doomy guttural funeral style doom like that. Um, and I think they actually did one uh, reunion show at Roadburn uh, yeah. maybe 10 years ago. Like, it's like the one show they did and then they, you know, maybe like 15, 20 years before that, they did like two shows in existence. It was like a huge fucking deal. You could probably find it on YouTube or something. But yeah, that one album they put out is just dirty nasty yeah i remember our dude. friend josh like was you know worked at the record store and would bring us all these gems and he would you know was all about he's all it has a picture of her on the front singing right on the cover of it yeah, yeah. i remember it pretty yeah. clearly and like him throwing it on first and not showing it to me and i was like damn this fucking singer's brutal and then he showed me the picture of her i'm like what the fuck? Yeah, that's this coming, like that's coming out of Scandinavian her? fairy woman with long blonde hair. Yep. And like this is coming out of her. What the fuck? I know yeah. it was insane. What so not to pick on the whole female vocalist things a lot, but what other female vocalists do you look up to nowadays that are new and up and coming? Um, you know, well, uh, to make a point about the female vocalist thing, I don't really, I'm not offended by that. I know like a lot of uh, female musicians are like i'm not a you know they get really i, I don't care. yeah <laughs> you know it's, it's well, i mean cheney, i was you know when i was on cheney's podcast when cheney naveen and we were talking about it and she was like just saying you know she gets asked like the same questions like all the time like oh what's it like being a female in an old guy band you know stuff like that like those kind of like questions that everyone thinks when they see it but and they think they're the first person to ask it but like someone you know in that position gets asked it every fucking time they sit down for an interview you know so that's the only yeah. reason why i had like respect for not trying to like blow that up too much you know oh yeah no i mean i don't mind i i, I get it it's it's still something of an anomaly because it's it's not it, i mean i don't know if that's i don't know if that's true i don't know if it's an anomaly it's just not commonly like you don't see it as much you know exactly. like there's there's tons of bands out there there's not that many female vocalists doing metal that aren't doing no offense to lacuna coil but aren't doing like lacuna coil style vocals mm -hmm. it is what it is so i get it um but vocalists you know there's a couple bands that i really love they're maybe not uh in the metal realm specifically but i really love um this band called dying for it they're from california they do like hardcore shit um again it's just my hardcore my love for hardcore um female vocalists they're fucking awesome uh, I don't think they're still together anymore, but there's a band, there was a band called Super Unison or Super Union, um, and they were on Death Wish, and they're fucking awesome. I love her voice. Um, 
I'm a huge fan of Walls of Jericho being, you know, like a Detroit area native. Um, huge fan of Candace. I really love Walls of Jericho. I love Candace. I think she's a super powerful person. Yeah. Um, and I'm just like, you know, it's funny because I, when I just hear really cool music, I listen to the vocals for their complexity and like for shit that maybe I want to like evolve into more so than whether it's a female or male vocalist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I, I still really love what Karen's doing now with uh, Gospel of the Witches. Like she's put out some really cool albums outside of the crisis realm that <clears throat> I don't think get enough enough attention because she's such a visionary artist. She also put out... Um, she put out a, a side project like this. It's all, it's like multi layers of vocals and like it's mm. heavy, but it's not metal. I forgot what it's called, but check out Karen Crisis, find out everything she's doing, follow her, love her forever, <laughs> like I do. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. check it out for sure. I remember bands like Mythic from back in the day, too. That was, uh, oh, I remember that shit. Yeah, they were fucking heavy as hell. Like, hell yeah. Uh, and they were all female, too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. November's Grief, I think, from the. Quebec too is it was it November Street or November? Oh shit! I oh, forget. Delete that. <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> no edits, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> and I don't think you know, like, <laughs> but no, I, I think you know it, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, I, I, my question that I want to ask Lindsay is: Do you find that uh, do you find that endearing that people would say like, you know, ah, you know, great female vocalist or something like that? Like, I mean, you, you are separating from the pack, you know, in, in terms of. You know, it's it's a male dominated scene. It's just that's how it is. When yeah. you've got someone who has like the strength uh, of uh, uh, the power that you have, you know, the, the voice, the writing, you know, like I, I find you're I find you're amazing writer. You know, these are these are things that are, you know, I I, I know it's you know it's so what it's a gender situation, but but I I, I, I kind of find that endearing that you know that you're 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 in the scene, you're in you're, you're playing, you're writing, you're you're. You know, I, I just I, I find it's awesome. I don't know. I, I love totally. it. Totally. And there's yeah, tons. Of it. It's like a it's a male female thing. Big deal. It's yeah. Not, not a. You know. So you set it. You set it apart. You say, oh, it's a female well, because you're female. You know. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I I well, I appreciate that greatly. That's that means a lot to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not. I will say I'm 100 percent not offended by it because it's like if we're just going to like break it down anatomically, it is harder to make these sounds when you don't naturally have like the, the chest depth and the throat in the, the meat and the muscle that you, that a lot of the male vocalists have to like resonate sound. I mean, that's just what it is. Like Mm -hmm. it's, that has nothing to do with gender specifically. It has everything to do with anatomy. And, you know, I, I have to practice. I have to find those pockets of sound in my body where I can make those really deep, um, resonant sounds to get really low and get those guttural. So it is, it is maybe a little bit more challenging, but it's a different, you know, it's something that I love. So I, I make concessions for it and I work at it, you know, um, conversely, there's a lot of things that female vocalists can do that male vocalists can't do, you know, like I Mm -hmm. would consider myself to have a lot of a, a higher clean singing range where I can go to like those Sebastian Bach level, you know, <laughs> heavy mixes and still go to the guttural side because that's my anatomy. Cause I can, I naturally have kind of more of a soprano voice. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't find it offended at all. I think it is endearing in a lot of ways. It is, it, you know, it's something that does set me apart, sets a lot of other female vocalists apart. Um, and I think it's fun. I just have fun with it. And I mean, you know, like if people ask me, like, what's it like being a female vocalist in metal? I'm like, it's cool. I enjoy it. I have fun. You know, I'm not offended by it at all. Um, mm. You know, and I think it, it I have a, a different perspective on what heavy is than mm. a lot of people because of what I grew up listening to and just the things I listen to now and how I interpret it and how I express what heavy is, is just, you know, it's unique to me. So if somebody points that out, that it's different, I'm really happy about that, you know? That's so awesome. Take yeah, us ahead. take us into uh the first like project that you got involved in on the <laughs> mic. Um so I was in this band called I Matador um in San Diego and it was a sort of uh progressive heavy metal project like so I came from like the you know hardcore like you know uh fucking brutal metal realm and then our <laughs> guitar player our bass player was into like indie rock. So like 
Sunny Day Real Estate. And then our guitar player was into like Pantera. And then our drummer was into like, you know, fucking Sepultura. So we had all these different sounds going on. Um, and I'm at it or we, we put out like a, a four length. We did shows around San Diego and it was fun. It was just, we were very weird at the time. Like, I don't think people really understood us because we had this sort of like amalgamate sound of different things. It was very emotional at the same time, but heavy. And it was like, if you could, if you could imagine like indie rock and gone brutal death metal, that's kind of what we were doing. I think we might still be on my space. Indie rock through the death metal <laughs> prism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it wasn't even like conceptual to, to that extent. It was just what it was because of our individual influences but um you could probably find it on my space if you're so inclined if you want to find something embarrassing but <laughs> <laughs> um but we had a we had a, a really good run there for a couple of years um our drummer so every time we would get set up for like a tour or something cool going on our drummer was in the navy at the time mm. and he would disappear for like weeks and couldn't tell us where he was going he was like special ops navy and we're like oh fuck we can't Trip. tour yeah, so then he'd come back and he, I don't know, he did something weird or I couldn't talk about it. And like, so like the first time I met this guy, he tried out for our band. He told me like his name, he came up with this name, this this fake name. He said his name was Dave Bugliotti, right? And we're like, we we, we like assumed that was his name for fucking ever. Oh no, it was Chuck Bugliotti, right? So we're like, oh, Chuck Bugliotti, what a weird name. But okay, that's, we called him Chuck for like a few months, right? And then uh, one day we went to practice and our bass player saw his, uh, like his dog tags or something. And it had his name. It was, his first name is Dave and his last name, I won't say his last name, but we're like, your name is David, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, you gave us a fake name this entire time. Like what kind of special ops are you? Like you can't even tell us your name. But, uh, you know, we could have, we could have done, I think a lot more if we were just a little bit more organized, but I had fun. It was kind of like my first uh, time on stage and, um you know getting drunk with your friends at like fucking brick by brick and you know just brick by brick yeah go yeah. brick by brick i think that's actually the last like really good metal venue in san diego i don't really think that the other ones are around anymore which really sucks and metal scene in san diego just kind of like it, it i don't know it kind of like comes and goes in waves like there was a really strong few years there and then like the bands kind of dissipate and then more bands come in and then they kind of go away and you know it was, it's a hard, it's a hard scene to kind of like get out of, I think, for a lot of bands. Mm -hmm. Anthony has some stories about brick by brick. Yeah, I probably already <laughs> told him. I just couldn't get in because yeah, I was too young. I got caught and <laughs> I got pissed at him and yelled at the security while I was on performing and then they had to escort me out and yeah. It was fun. Yeah, we, were, we were in the same age group. I had to, I had to hide in the bathroom before. They the all ran. I'm, dude, I did, we definitely said, told this story. But yeah, they all got in. And then I was the last guy where the security guy just looked and saw me, you know, <laughs> everybody else. And I'm just like, guys, no. Yeah, well, we, we, we were all 21. But like I you weren't. I think I guess yeah. you and Joel were the only ones that were. Ivan, yeah. Ivan, Joel, me oh, and, and Danny Bohegan were uh, all the, yeah. young, the youngins that couldn't yeah. get in. That was fucked up though. Just, he basically like did this set and like they had security waiting on the side stage to just. Yeah, throw him I out. literally yeah I was taken <laughs> out like of the building guys. as He's soon like... as our set ended. I'm, I was like, here you go, this way, way out the door. Like, yeah, good show, <laughs> but out fuck, the fucking door, dude. get the fuck out of here. You were talking <laughs> shit on the stage though. <laughs> I know yeah. he stole fuck security about like in the fucking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's a way to win him over. <laughs> Look at him. They're, right? they're like seven oh, feet away from me. Anthony was a little bit too bright-eyed and bushy-tailed that night. <laughs> yeah. I was just pissed because all my friends g uh, fucking got the scam done and I didn't, dude. Yep. <laughs> they snuck in and I I tripped a fucking wire or something. I mean, that's basically how I, you know, being caught by security and not letting me into a show is how I met Odious, you know, <laughs> like being outside of a venue and just was like, whatever, I'm going to listen to Origin outside then. And then I met the rest of the... I met David and stuff outside, and that's pretty much. So it's that's kind of a, fate, it could be a blessing dude. in disguise sometimes. Yeah, I, don't know. I remember so being cool. in like high school, and like somehow I was like driving by brick by brick, and I was like, you know, like I don't know, sixteen or something, and not Nile was playing, and I was like, oh man, I want to go. I like totally couldn't. I just like the era. whole line of people. I was like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, I know. When shows would come locally, I would just go listen to them outside. I would just be like, whatever. I just need to be be close to it. <laughs> like yeah. i can't really even hear what's going on it's just a bunch of bass you know i'm like but yeah just something about being there 
I felt like I had to be. I don't know. It's a weird young kid thing of me. But anyways, <laughs> so Mike, uh, so we're talking about, uh, so, I mean, you know, female vocalists too. Cynic had in their first tour with Cannibal Corpse, they had a female vocalist doing all the, the growls and shit. No. Did you know that? No. So she had, didn't? No. The, the keyboard player did all the death growls on that tour. Well, I remember like them panning over to a girl going, Rah, like and shit. And that's yeah. what I was seeing a video yeah, yeah. on YouTube. I, I know Back on in the Berkeley that- Square show? Think that so. that yeah. that tour i thought uh, she was just because there's fem- there's clean vocals in those songs too because she ended up being in portal with them yeah after focus yeah okay but, so she was growling too that's crazy i'm pretty sure I knew I it was a different dude it was a different dude on those recordings yeah, yeah. it wasn't on the recordings i don't think i think it was live so he never still... went out with them oh shit he might have i just remember like i loved that whole era of was like cannibal bringing cynic on and they have like you know, they're a weird fucking prog band with a mm-hmm. fucking, you know, fucked with a knife band. And then like, and well, then they have like taking chances on both sides too. cannibal yeah. taking chances, cynic taking chances. Yep. Yeah, definitely. definitely. We, we, uh, we actually played my, that band infestation I was talking about earlier. We played with them on that tour. Oh, sure. uh, I, I honestly, I don't remember if she was singing heavy stuff or not. I, I, I can't, I, you know, it's a long fucking time. I'm going to go. I'm going to look up was, some footage. See. Yeah, was it the same? Uh, it was a fucking great tour, though. That's for sure. Yeah. Was it the same vocalist who did the uh, the clean recordings on um, Endless Endeavors? I think it was on. Uh, yeah, that's the that's, that's the same vocal portal song, right? Yeah, right? I think so. Yeah. 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 So she went. Yeah, all the female vocals on Focus, I think, is the same chick who did Portals with them after focus paul and sean went on to do portals i don't know if sean uh, malone was in portals though was he that's something that i can't no idea i don't don't think no idea i don't think it was i may be wrong yeah well i mean so i mean for Lindsay and mike how did you guys get connected like because i know that you guys i mean haven't really spoke i mean hung out that much so how would you guys get actually yeah and get we, the... we found out this is the first time you guys actually <laughs> spoke face to face first time we actually talked yeah. but uh, we were saying that earlier before we started recording uh you know the podcast. yeah, yeah. You know, we get on they were like hey dude. Lindsay, hey mike how's it going Girl, nice hey. cali Cal- yeah. pod bringing fucking band members you together. see what yeah, social that's... media does it's like i've like what we've been probably talking virtually for like the last couple of years, but uh, like it seems like we've been like communicating, but it's just through social media. So it's just that's yeah. the power of Facebook, I guess. Ah, uh, it's a, it's it's high time. That's all I'll say. It's high yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean that's the nature of the project too, though. Like yeah, the, the, the yeah. whole project has been based on you know I, I haven't met a single person like face to face and anyone in Coma Cluster Boy. Uh, Gene uh, Gene Strider, I've only spoken to. I mean, it's all been email based for years. It was email based, and uh, and then we started. We 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 spoke on. Uh, I think it was Messenger actually, um, two times. I think that's it. And we've put out two records. Working on a third record, Jeez. and uh, it's you know it's it's. I, admittedly, it's alien to me. You know, I'm used to being in a room with people and and mm-hmm. playing. But uh, but you know, you, as musicians, you know, you, you got to roll with the times or get the fuck out. And. Um, yeah. And uh, that's that's just the nature of this this project, and it's been working quite fluidly, you know. So uh, I'm going to be fully honest. I had no idea of what the band sounded like until you had mentioned it, and you guys were going to be coming on. And so I was like, I, okay, obviously I'm I'm going to do my due diligence and listen. And I I went in with such a different expectation because I had checked out Eyes of Perdition. And I thought that maybe this was just going to be another brutal death metal band, given your guys' pasts. And uh, I was floored because I'm the avant-garde guy. I'm the experimental weird metal guy. And I realized like I, this band is what, like closest to what I listen to mostly right now. And I didn't even fucking know that we were going to have a band like this on the show Mm. because I figured we were staying in the more, you know, technical brutal death metal realm. We've ventured off of that, but this is something totally different and refreshing and unsettling. And uh, of what I've heard so far, I, I did some digging. There's no releases with you on it, Lindsay yet. Right. Or is Uh, it? 
Not yet, but we are working on it. Yeah, well, yeah. Surely. <laughs> That's what we nice. can say. So I, the previous two records is the ones that I was able to listen to. And Mike, you're fucking, you're, you're sounding probably the best I've ever heard you on that shit. Thank you, man. Appreciate no it. doubt. Like the, it is like signature Mike, but like t- turn it up to 11, dude. That's that's exactly what I'm feeling. Like you're fucking killing the vocals on that shit, dude. So props to you for that, dude. Uh, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. You know, uh, I mean, you know, the, as a musician, you're 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 always looking for something that's going to be the next challenge. You know, the last thing I want to do is to you know be pigeonholed. I think any musician doesn't want to be pigeonholed into a you know into into a corner, and that's all that you're going to do. So you know, when when Gene approached me actually I think it was Sylvia who approached me first and ironically enough it was through uh, LinkedIn of all places and they had reached out to me and they sent me some snippets of like a couple pieces like 30 second little clips of, of riffs and uh, I was like you know I had had after after Cryptopsy I'd had people reach out to me and say you know you want to you want to join this band or whatever and I always turned it down you know mm-hmm. um, but this was something different this was something that I had not heard that style uh so efficiently done, you know, yeah. um, and, you know, and I, I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I felt it immediately. I was like, yeah, I have to be part of this, you know, but as, as we progressed, like putting the songs together for, for you know, for mine cemeteries, uh, for the first record, uh, this, you, you know, I think you had just said, uh, uh Anthony, you had just said, uh, what did you say? It was unsettling. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I remember my wife, the best way though. <laughs> yeah. You know, I remember my wife at the time, like listening, listening to it. And she, and she would, she literally said, it's, this is like cancer on, uh, on cassette or cancer. on. <laughs> this is like ca- the, the form of cancer through music, you know, like, uh, and it, there's it, it, little, there's little release. You know? I'm sorry. Yeah. I was, I was saying there's, there's minimal release from it's tension. very like unrelenting, you know, yeah. like, I think that's what I love about it is it's, it's so, unsettling but it's also unrelenting and it's like oh, yeah. you cannot trace it back to any one specific point you just kind of have to go along with the right and it's incredibly intense and like when I was doing some vocals to record uh one of the new songs it was like it you it really does kind of overwhelm you and consumes you like mm-hmm. I was just pulling out stuff from like my freaking my the id my id just to like get enough energy to like keep up with the pace of the music I'm really excited about the new stuff we're working on but I mean those first two albums too are just like I was a mega fan before I was even recruited or to join I was a huge fan especially of that first album um having Lord, I, when Lord Worm was on a, a guest on one of the songs and I was like a huge fan of that and then like being able to be a part of this entire project is like a dream come true for me Personally, like I'm still like amazed. I'm like, I can't even believe this is. Well, a yeah. Part of my- so you had mentioned earlier coming across Cryptopsy and and that being a turning point for you, and then all of a sudden, fast forward to now, you're in, <laughs> you're in a band yeah. with, with Mike. It's, it's like, like sh- you know, it's it's a weird you know uh, coming full circle type of thing or dream come true. I don't know. I don't know how to like really put it together, but I mean, it's just kind of the culmination of everything that I love musically and then people that I really admire and respect for their their prowess and their talent and being able to collaborate with them is like it's literally kind of a dream come true for me um yeah yeah, go go ahead sorry no go sorry go ahead I was gonna say like because I randomly went to the the page because I had just listened to it on Spotify and I went to the Facebook page and I was like what the fuck is that Mike from fucking through the eyes of the dead on drums and so I randomly messaged him. I was like, are you in this band? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm having them on tomorrow or something like that. And he's all, yeah, dude. I mean, you know, it's kind of the same kind of where you guys are coming from, like kind of probably through email or something like that. He's in the band or so- something like that. Because he was kind of like, yeah, it's a, it's kind of like this thing I'm doing on the side, blah, blah. And I was like, holy shit. Like, because I've known Mike and I, I promised I wouldn't tell many stories about him, but I've toured with him. <laughs> um, but yeah, that guy, he's mellowed out. He he reiterated that he's mellowed out a lot <laughs> from when I used to know him. But uh, yeah, that guy, I mean, I love that guy. Me and him got along right away on the, on, you know, on the Through the Eyes of the Dead, I forget, like Suffocation. I forget what bands were on that tour, but um, that guy was fucking awesome. And he was a tough for being the skinny, scrawny little guy. That guy held his, uh, he's like a skinny Billy Milano. Like, <laughs> I saw him, okay, one time. I saw him beat up two guys at once, one time. Nice. And <laughs> yeah, and I was like, what? And they were way bigger than him. And I was like, 
I like stood back like Jesus, like he was like the nicest, sweetest guy to me the whole time. And then someone just started like, put, like try to fight him at a show in like uh, Pomona or something. And he just like ruined both of them and like ran away. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck? Is this? this guy's a ninja. I didn't even know this guy. Yes. But, you know, yeah, he's uh, that uh, coming from Through the Eyes of the Dead. That was a really cool band to tour with. I had a great time with them. They're a great, great band. So to get him, I mean, he's in the band, right? I saw the picture. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, he I mean, that was I was super stoked because he sent he sends me stuff of his to like listen to like new projects and stuff all the time. And uh, I he never met. I didn't hear about this band until I like looked at that picture of the top cover picture and i'm like is that it's mike and another like another band I'm like <laughs> like that's cool that he's doing that and he you got him a, it's a good guy he is a phenomenal fucking drummer like yeah uh, watching watching him play is uh, you, you know what you to, to to be in this project you you know the, the backbone of this project i mean you know in any band you need a, a great drummer but but honestly like he is just no matter what gene is throwing at him and gene throws some fucking tough riffs and he is just laying the shit down, man. It's uh, it's 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 something to That's be. That's awesome, man. Be yeah, it's kind of getting like a, a like a grand all star band together from the new school and old school to get. It's a mm-hmm. fucking awesome, man. And especially in that kind of, you know, I got a, I listen when I listened to Coma a, a couple times. It had a real kind of a a mixture of like like car bomb with yeah. like. Mm-hmm. with like uh i mean i don't want to say like dillinger stuff kind of too i was getting like, like some death spell vibes at yeah, death spell like yeah. it had a bunch of cool different avant-garde feels to it like all mixed in one melting pot it wasn't like exactly like one of those bands it was like it would be like one of those bands for a second then it would just fucking spin you for a loop and do something completely different and that's what i love mm-hmm. about it mm-hmm. yeah and that's what that, me too I, honestly that's that's the big thing for me as well is that uh, back to what i was saying about the, the challenge aspect to to music you know, when, when, when you've got these songs in front of you and now you've got to put your focus in and, and you, you know, you, you want to come up with something that's not going to be run of the mill, obviously, anytime you yeah. do music, but, but you, it needs something that's going to fall in and out of the cracks of the, of the riffs for that style of music. And, you know, and that was, you know, especially with like uh, Thoughts from a Stone, you know, it's a 23 minute long song, something that I personally have always wanted to do. I'm a huge fan of like Pink Floyd, you know, 23 minute long songs and, you know, any band that's got Edge of Sanity doing 45 minute, you know, record Crimson and things like this. This is something that's always been appealing to me. Yeah. So to have that, uh, that chance to be able to write a song uh, with so many different changes and the mood and the atmosphere is just so all, all over the place. Um, and to be able to work on something like that was was an absolute dream come true. You know, come true, really. Yeah, was. That, I mean, for me, actually, last night I'll just talk about it a little bit. I got to, I took my mom to see uh, King Crimson. Oh, they came nice. through. Yeah, they randomly came through, and I mean, they were planning on coming through, but it was, uh, you know, my mom's like, <laughs> I'm flying out for it. Mom was like, Jesus, she like flew out. She lives in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and flew her out fucking just watched fucking king crimson for a couple hours last night with like this seeing where all these bands came from like i see where tool comes from i see where all these bands like have have taken and not taken but taken influence from them and uh yeah it's it's so ahead of their time i just was so blown away Mm -hmm. about like they had three drummers in the front of the uh, it's three drummers in the front and then they had like robert fripp tony levin who's been like every fucking band and like all these like amazing fucking musicians and they were just like the drum, all the drummers were a part of certain parts and like they would mix do, do like battle each other in the middle of the songs they would do things and i was just like and they're like literally tony levin is 75 robert fripp is 75 year, years old and they're doing this and i'm just like sitting there just going like fuck wow. should I, I don't know should I, even- <laughs> I, I listened to you. since you were going i i spun some king crimson yesterday i listened to larks i listened to fucking uh in the court red uh, mm-hmm. Three is a perfect pair. That that song's fucking dope, dude. Even though it's like later on, it's still sick, dude. Yeah, that's in like their '80s or late '70s era, right? Three is a perfect yeah, think, pair. Yeah. You guys, listen yeah, yeah, to that yeah. One? yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, What's remember. the song that's on Mandy? It's the opening track of of the movie Mandy, and it's on Red. It's the last song on Red. That fucking song is absolutely awesome. Uh, yeah. I can't think. Of- oh, the first song on Red. You're saying? Yeah, the last track. Oh, like a 10 last minutes, track. Just Fuck, what is it amazing. called? Amazing. Like, yeah, that yeah. that I'd love all that Thank shit, man. dude. I highly advise everyone if they've skipped King Crimson, King Crimson, to check that out and just go through their discography uh, and just Providence, fucking Providence, Starless, Starless, Starless. Starless that's it, Starless. man. Fucking incredible! What a Hell song. Yeah. I remember yeah. that one. Yeah. 
Dope. Well, that was a that's a mind bending bending show. If you guys get a chance to see that, if it comes to your town, I was jealous for sure. <laughs> nice. Uh, I mean, I'm skipping it. Too. I'm skipping the show to be here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's there tonight. Oh, it's in it's LA. Tonight. Yeah. Uh, uh, Beauty's there. Oh, that's so some, that's some dedication right from the professor, dude. No, I uh, I knew I was doing other. <laughs> He's stuff like, I and... can't. I can't. Joel already. Joel already moved it. I moved it because of King Crimson. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we couldn't do the show unless one of us didn't go to King Crimson. So <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> Joel threw, threw straws on that one. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm just like yeah. talking to like like messaging Lindsay. Like, yeah, fuck yeah, Thursday we got this. Blah blah. No, blah. full like, disclosure, it was uh, Joel. You you're going to King Crimson next yeah, week. Yeah, someone right? told me like, that, oh, and I was like, "Oh dude. shit, I am." It was me, dude. <laughs> and it was while I was at your house. No, on the phone with you that I was. Yeah, like, we're like, "Is well, Joel going to King Crimson?" We like Thursday? looked it up and we're like, uh, "Isn't that on Thursday when we do the <laughs> yeah. podcast?" Like, you know. And he's just like, "Dude, yeah, dude, I'm going to see King Crimson with my mom, dude." Yeah, it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna go live and just do a podcast yeah. with my phone. I'll see you guys like, next week. He's like doing the podcast <laughs> while watching King Crimson, like holding up his phone, like on Zoom, like. <laughs> Just yeah, all guys, the pissed so... off dads like oh, what the shut the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it a bunch of dads oh yeah it was it was awesome just like a bunch of like like the gray like long there's dudes with like long gray hair a bunch now, of fred like, oh, yeah man. yeah they're just like they kind of got that <laughs> kind of they're like retired metalhead guys now you know that's kind of getting these as we get older we're going to see some people that are like you know loved cryptopsy and shit and they're like at these like shows like with just these like these trying to be cool look like a different Long, look you know yeah they got like a kind of a kind of a cool artsy shirt on and they got like you know like maybe like one metal patch or something they're just like, like you know they like have know, a guitar weird. collection and stuff <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's just uh yeah anyways check it out sorry to little segue check it that, out but check, check it out, it King it Crimson, out. you ever heard of it yeah no fucking anyways so <laughs> um music. on the coma cluster void beat i remember all the stuff like of the beginning of the project coming out like i remember seeing some videos i remember hearing some demos before so was thoughts of a stone the first official release from the band no it was it was mine cemeteries mine cemeteries oh. was the first release but um what what gene did was she put it out on um on dryland's records it's it's her it's her record label oh, okay. uh, since then what what happened is we had signed to translation loss records uh and then um thoughts from a stone had come out through them and now uh subsequently mind cemeteries is being re-released through them uh, on oh. vinyl both, both are on vinyl and uh well cd2 actually they're going to release it on cd as well oh, uh, so. but 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 technically it was the first record okay that's helpful um i just remember like being like okay this band is gonna be sick as fuck because i was into like like portal a lot at the time and i was into the dissonant stuff and i was into like the you know low uh string guitars and is there isn't there like a 10 string guitar on the yep. material yep. yeah yep. and i was just like okay well that's right it's, it's like uh, it's more than nine or eight just yeah scary. <laughs> yeah and i just remember thinking like dude this is this is the project for me like this is perfect this is like all the things i like and uh yeah so i've just have been a fan ever since those early demos and i remember like sending it to people i'm like dude check this out like this this band is going to be huge and so i'm just stoked that it's still going and that there seems to be a lot of momentum behind the project absolutely yeah i mean we are we are, we are currently as you know as Lindsay was saying we are working on new material mm -hmm. and uh i think at this point Lindsay, we have what two songs i think i, I recorded two yeah i think i recorded two I, I, I don't think it was you i think it was austin right yeah i, 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 I know you got some some of your stuff coming up too uh that we're going to be working on yeah so i think the way it's kind of you know since there's three vocalists in the band there's myself mike and austin um and he's in portland so we're incredibly distributed um but from my understanding of how we're working this it's like each song has kind of you know one of us takes something of a lead and then the other vocalists kind of support that. So, you know, one of the songs, Mike's the lead, one of the songs, Austin's the lead, one of the songs, I'm the lead. Um, so we've been kind of trading off like that. Um, and I, you know, cannot like, I cannot overemphasize how brutal <laughs> these songs are, mm -hmm. you know, just it's, I'm so excited about it. Um, and I think it's just, it's such a, it's such a really intricate project too, that if you're it's like one of those things where if you're a musician you can listen to it and just break everything down and just like fucking get lost in the complexity of the music if you just love brutal music you can just enjoy it for how heavy it is as well um so i think it's just 
it's really a genius project. I mean, I can't like overstate like how excited I am about everything we're doing. So how much do you guys contribute? Like, are, are you able to write your own shit and bring it to the pot or who's the, who's the, is there a puppet master of the band? Like a main person that's been there from the beginning. It's their brainchild. I would say Jean for sure. <laughs> I, I hate the term puppet master because she's so wonderful. But <laughs> I know. I, I changed the strings of <laughs> yeah, she, do your she, thing. She really do your well, if, if if I mean if so, if they literally give lyrics and tell you how to do it, it's basically a puppet master situation where you come in and just do what they're saying to do. I wouldn't she's like say she's off. yeah. She's never told me how to interpret the uh, the arrangement and what I choose to do vocally. So mm -hmm. I love that where I can really yeah. just you know feel it out the way that I I hear it in my head and and do that. Um, and I, I really love having that freedom. And I think she understands that each of us are bring something unique to the table and that we should have the freedom to be able to, yeah. to do that, to make the, to make the project what it is really, you know? Yeah. She, she, uh, you know, the one area that she, she may be more involved in is like, uh, you know, sort of, you know, I, I how she envisions, she sees, um, you know, this section maybe having some vocals, uh, certain sections. Mm -hmm. I'd like vocals on these sections, mm -hmm. uh, but Aside from that, other sections are open and words, the, the lyrics, the content is 100% up to us. Nice. There is, there is theme, uh, you know, for both those first two yeah. records, there are themes for, for those records. And subsequently, we were, we were actually planning this, the new album, uh, Absurd Romanticism, as something that was going to be a full, uh, uh, an extra to, or, or a, a continuation, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, an elaboration, actually, uh, of, of the first two records. Um, and I think, you know, with, with my own personal shit that was going on, we had, we had spoken a lot on how we were going to, you know, we had come up, we, initially, we had come up with the story, you know, planned for this, a full plot. Um, wow. and, and, uh, and then it just kind of, you know, I was, I wasn't in the frame of uh, mind for that. So I think we put it on hold for that. And these are not to say that it's just a collection of songs because it's not, it is going to be an album, but it, yeah. it's not touching on every song doesn't touch on the first two albums. Um, mm -hmm. There are songs like, in fact, the last one we just did uh, is based on it's, it's an elaboration of one of the characters, if you will, of, of, uh, of mind cemeteries that comes back and, and we, we, you know, we elaborate on, on that story a bit. But it was going to be a full concept album, but it's it, it, at this point, it's not. Right on. I will say that I'm looking forward to when the world opens up again because I had plans to actually be in Germany to see Jean and Sylvia like in person for the first time uh. last year. That just went to shit, obviously. Um, so I'm hoping next year I'll actually be able to go out there and, and see them in person and like interact with them in like a meaningful human way you know um it's just so interesting like we were saying earlier like these you know the way music is done these days a lot of bands like a good a good band to think about in this context is Mashuga. i think um which i think there was one album that they recorded entirely separate from each other so they just sort of like swap files and you know and you can it's a phenomenal album of course but it's just the way things are done these days um yeah for a lot That's of we bands had to do our re most recent release too none of us were together yeah, because I mean, how good can, I mean, not to, you know, there's a lot of great local bands that find each other and they put out amazing music, but sometimes if you're looking for a specific sound or a specific, um, you know, somebody with a, a really good technical prowess on drums, for example, and they're not in your town, you have to virtually explore your options, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, Coma Cluster Void project is, it's like, it's such a, it is, it, it's the kind of sum of its parts. All of us bring something so different and yet so powerful to the project that's why i think it's so immense and it's not just like oh it's this german band that's doing this crazy stuff it's like no there's all these other people involved across the world who are bringing their absolute best to the songs yeah then I, like I mean like necrophages did that too i mean um when they basically they had people in pretty much every different country i mean not every different but three different countries or something like that they would swap files and they literally would meet up like never meeting each other they would meet up for one or two days and then go on tour <laughs> like just getting everyone like with that crazy music like okay we we know it to the the power tab or guitar profile like we can jam to it perfectly the click is down we have it all down let's just, and just meet up in one room 
play it, make sure it like works and then just leave for tour, like on a headlining tour. Yeah. It's like, that sounds like a freaky to me, but it's <laughs> with technology nowadays. It's so much more doable to do it like that. I do have to say, I, I love, I, I do enjoy the in-person experience. I mean, that's one of the reasons yeah. why I sought out eyes of perdition is because I was missing that. Like, let's just get sweaty in a jam room together and just yeah. figure it out as we go along. Like I really miss that. Um, totally miss that. That's the yeah. main thing that I miss, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if I can ju just uh, uh, touch on uh, something you said, Lindsay, uh, about the uh, about CCV, is that you 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 can break down the songs uh, individually with like instruments and stuff like that. And I, I you know I don't always listen to music like that. Um, there are a few albums, and one that just came to mind when you were mentioning that that I had done a ton of this with is. The, for you know, rush uh, moving pictures. Yeah, oh, those yeah. albums that you can break apart and listen to bass only. Listen, then the next time you're listening to it, it's Neil guitar the whole time, dude. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I find myself with you know, not that I listen to you know, fucking put on fucking CCB and listen to it all the time. <laughs> but what I have, um, it, it is something that I have done. That I have broken up in my you know, listening to that 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 experience. I have broken up to listen to all the different. Uh, the instrumentation that's that's happening there and uh, i think that's it, it's just one of those records you can do that too yeah i Not enjoy that too it. i enjoyed the way you just taking it all in at once but like when when you when you geek out on a project you tend to do that okay i'm going to go through the whole thing and just try and keep my focus on the drums the whole time try and keep yep. my focus on what happens with the, and you end up finding like new things that you you can't catch in the whole blast at your face but definitely I, just t sitting back and just letting it take you is also a great way to listen to certain yeah. things too you know i do that a lot or i've done that a lot with cryptopsy throughout the years because i feel like each cryptopsy epoch was so unique and you know, whether it was like the earlier albums or Mike's era and the current, you know, like I, I listen to it. I, I'm not like a super musician. Like I don't play guitar that well, I, you know, but I, I listen to the individual instruments and there's so much going on. There's so much complexity and like the way everything like comes together and then moves apart. You know, like I do that a lot with Cryptopsy and I think that that was a huge influence on me and how I interpret music and how I find what I think complex is and what I think heavy is and what's jazzy or you know it's like breaking apart the music into to those different sections and kind of really absorbing it and, and it helps me to understand music differently you know than just Very listening so. to it as like a wall of sound yeah yeah and then these types of projects too that's that's something that's a, a major asset i think is that you can break it down I, i've had to break it down like just just writing material for it mm -hmm. uh, you know you if you can separate yourself from every instrument and, and, you know, and like I was talking about, like weaving yourself in and out of, you know, the different riffs and stuff like that. If you can Which is that, what you do very work. well with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Your, your placement of vocals are in really random spots though, too, in a good way, but it's just like to count, like what you were just saying to, you, you had to break it down to know when you're going to be putting vocals in this spot. And there's things that you probably follow in certain spots you might follow the guitar there, but it's going to be the drums on this part. And yeah, those are the, those, those are things that fucking are, are as a vocalist, that, that's the only thing where you feel like, okay, I'm being technical with this shit. I have to count too with these guys. You know? <laughs> no, sure. Yeah. And, and you know, and I, I'm not, a, I'm not a count. Honestly, like I'm, I'm really not a counter for me. I, I feel it naturally. And yeah. it's always been that with, with any project, Cryptopsy included, I, I feel it naturally. And, and, you know, I don't want to say it's just, you know, one, two, three, four, one, because it's not, but, yeah. but it, but it just naturally comes together with CCB. It was different. It was, it was that challenge of like, okay, like there's so much different shit happening here. How do I place it where it's, you know, it's, it's like half of uh, half the beat in and you're, mm. you're coming into all these different. Mm -hmm. So it's not just so, you know, I, I, I never want to be cookie cutter by, by any means, but, but there's, there's a natural, um, rhythm i think within us as as you know any musician so you always going to sort of lean towards something that's kind of you know you, you can kind of follow it with that but uh, but with this particular project it's not that and and uh, uh it was it was it was quite cool to break it down like that and, and find the different places you could you could put something in and not be so uh you know just that natural progression of 
placing it where I, where I would normally play something mm -hmm. and then pulling it away, like just, you know, half a second later or half a second before or wherever, you know? It's, and with yeah. this project, there is no normal. So no. Uh, <laughs> there's so, no four, four really. <laughs> no, not, there's none. <laughs> But that's I cool. love it. That's I unique. love that aspect of you know, it. Hopefully that's what sets it aside from, from other projects and stuff. You know? Yeah. I mean, I love avant-garde. I love experimental. I love shit. I like things that my ears are realizing they haven't heard in this, you know, uh, mixture of frequencies, you know, it's like, uh, I, I can, my ears, Casey, my ears perk up when, <laughs> things are fresh you know the combination of sounds that are coming to my ear they have not come in this combination or similar or something you know something may have similar come in there but that that configuration has not yet and and i got that feeling from listening to uh coma for sure yeah it kind of like rearranges your your synapses a little bit, I, you know. I, I, mentioning things that we always mention. This is the thing. I love this analogy. It's like bands and music are their actual like software upgrades for our hard drives. We we have to listen to it one or more time. We have to upload it one or more times to our brain before our hard drive can actually, uh, you know take it in properly and understand the file and all that shit. So it's like coma it, it, that band and other bands like that, but just like I've, we've had so many of those, but like coma could be one of those bands that is going to upgrade the software and a new listener that hasn't heard that configuration combination of frequencies before. Great analogy. Actually yeah. that, that I like the it. I like the it in that. <laughs> it totally <laughs> is. It's exciting. It's exciting. And, and now I want all of us to go back and try and figure out how many of those software upgrades we actually got, like those albums that were literal upgrades to your hard drive and it'd be cool to figure out like oh yeah that's definitely when i got an mm -hmm. upgrade you know mm -hmm. i don't know no I, 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 <laughs> that makes sense man <laughs> you, I, you know, know i, 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 I don't, don't know. Think, i i never likened uh ccv as one of those bands that uh you know you you it's almost I, maybe this is wrong to say but it's almost for experienced listeners for metal you know like, yeah, you don't, I know what you're trying to say. You don't want to sound like you got to catch on to, you know? Like, I don't see it anyways. I don't see that, you know? But, you know, but I think someone who's, who's been around the scene and is, is anxious or, or is open to new, to new sounds and new styles, new time changes, new, just a whole overall new product, you know, is, is going to be more apt to, to, to listen to that and, and maybe catch it, maybe not even on the first time. Maybe it is five, five times. Listening Those to are it. the best albums though, that yeah. you have to continue listening mm -hmm. and they'll never, you'll never be, you'll never squeeze it dry. It'll always have something new for you. Yeah. Each listen, you know, I think you also have to be something of a receptive person you have to have a very open mind to what ccb does or just music in general um i think if you are like mike said you can be an experienced listener but if you're also very narrow in what your concepts of what metal is or like what heavy is you're not really going to fully appreciate everything that's going on you're going to kind of siphon off the reality of the immensity of the music by just saying, okay, I can't follow this. So, you know, I'm not gonna, or this isn't heavy enough for me, or there's not enough this or that. And um, there's a lot of bands out there that I think really push the envelope of what metal really can be or what it, you know, how it should evolve or the direction that it's going in. I think Coma Cluster is definitely one of those bands that, you know, I don't think we're really trying to, you know, I, I can't speak for Jean and, and what she's writing, but I don't think, you know, we're trying to be anything except for what we are. We're not trying to, you know, we're not That's trying to first like and foremost. That's the fit first in, and in any foremost. kind of realm. It's just, this is how we perceive what heavy is to us as individuals. And that's what comes out. Well, if you're not happy with the project before you put it out, then it's not the right it's not finished or it's not, you know, it's not the right thing for you to put out as an artist. I think it always has to be, and it sounds selfish, but it, it's true. You have to be at least, 
you know, you have to have the, um, you know, the drive to put this thing out. If you don't have the drive, to, if it's something that you don't have the drive to put out, then it's not really worth an artist's time, dude. Yeah. Like you have to, it has to be for you first. And then you're like, okay, let's put it out into the world. And then it's now we have no control. It's, yeah. It, doesn't yeah. Be, it really doesn't belong to you anymore once you put it out there because mm -hmm. it's going to get filtered through everybody's uh, neuroses and perceptions and experiences. And at that point, you really have to be completely hands off of the baby. You just got to let it become what it's going to be and then move on to the next thing or else you'll become super self-conscious and neurotic and controlling. And it's just, that's, I think that's the hardest thing about being a musician is really like you invest so much of yourself into what you create. And then as soon as you put it out, you have to just let it go. Like, you know, it's no longer yours. That's right. Yeah, yeah, you I can't sit back that. and make edits and change things that you put out. It's like, it's gone. Wait, yeah. It's, now it's gone. It's, it's not yours. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now it's for everyone's, everyone's ears to perceive and change around and judge and do whatever they want to do to it. It's was, like, it's on them now. Was it, I think it was when you were on Joel the uh, N the Copper Crab podcast with Naveen and Chaney and like mm -hmm. like you were talking about like like Naveen's like like you know it's like you're like you're doing this album and you're getting ready and like you're like putting your heart and soul into it and it's like the sickest thing ever to you like you know you're just like this is gonna be because it's gonna be groundbreaking it's gonna be this whole thing and then like yeah life's gonna be different out and, yeah yeah and then it comes out and it's like yeah people like like it and it's awesome but. And, and then that's it. It comes out. Well, it's like, like, I mean, on the also, next one, you know, well, they were talking about how like, and it's happened before. I mean, I'm sure yeah. to everyone, but like after it comes out, you're like, ah, oh, fuck, we should have done this there. We should have done uh, this. Yeah. There. Always. Like, after, you know, after yeah. Yeah. a million times. That's, that's like, a hundred percent. I, I think across <laughs> the board. Absolutely. Every, every musician goes through that. You're like, and even before you put it out, you're thinking that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're already thinking those, but you're like, ah, oh, fuck, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't want to be that guy to change everything around or yeah. 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 You know, Any artist I, that is fully 100% like down with it, what they put out and want no changes is lying, dude. Yeah, it, right. it's it, there's no, and that's why we're never finished. Yeah, we're never finished. But yeah. that's I mean, it. That's part of the part of the release of it is to just let it go. You know, let yeah. release it and let other people. You know, whatever whatever their their interpretation of it is is their own. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and I I think when you're writing, especially if you know the the, the where the success lies, and I and I I've learned this from experience, success lies in writing. For yourself yeah right for yourself and everything else that follows doesn't fucking matter anymore yeah because you've written what you felt fucking good with and everyone else it doesn't they love it they hate it it's great either way it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things yeah the end result is you put out something that you were fucking happy with first and foremost and all the rest is bunk you know? totally. i mean it's gonna yeah. be there until you die it's gonna be yeah. captured like this podcast will be you know one year, you know, It'll we won't be, be here anymore. This will if, still if, be here. If it's still here. All, yeah. All people still care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All it really is, it's like a, I, I look at music or like a song or like writing, it's like evoking some, some thing, spirit, whatever you want to call it, like some cloud. It's like you're evoking this thing, you know? The muse. So like when you like heard Sabbath and stuff back and you're just like, oh shit, they evoked this like crazy witch demon thing that like <laughs> rock and roll witch demon or something and it's like fucking so sick and it's or iron yeah. maiden this thing they evoked the eddie like the whole sound like everything about it and or judas priest like it's not just about like the music it's like there's like a, an aura that's like created with it like, like a movie like like when you watch blade runner like the original and it's just like the music and the scenery it's just like that, that's to me like music it it's super like visual it's visual like, to yeah brain, visual you know? and like I don't know. I just think that's super cool. So like when you like make something or you like, you like whatever, if you get that vibe that you like evoked this little tiny little cloud that came out and you're like, yeah, I did something. And then caught it, and <laughs> put it on recording, you know, just a little yeah. fart cloud. You're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you <know? laughs> See, I mean, to you, it's a fart just, cloud. And like you said, you let it, it feels everyone good. else. Yeah. It's not like everyone else right? gets to, a chance to like make it a fucking yeah. a beautiful, like, thundercloud yeah. you know not a fire cloud anymore right. like yeah. I mean, people can take it and they change it around to what they want it to be and that's that's kind of what Lindsay was saying and, and mike too about like how it's it's now open for interpretation if you want to like mm -hmm. let everything out and, and and actually uh i talked to trevor a lot about stuff he's really about more he he's kind of like weird about music nowadays he's trevor definitely from more black of, dahlia oh no no no. Uh, trevor, my, uh, roommate, oh your roommate okay i wasn't sure which but one, uh trevor. he's really he like misses 
like a lot of the mystery that was behind music that's uh, kind of like yeah. all out there now because now like you know his, his favorite band's tool and like yeah. you know stuff like that so like stuff that they they don't release like playthroughs they don't release like mm-hmm. things like that they're like you got it like this is on you it's for your imagination only for you don't sure. we're not gonna like give you anything <laughs> you know it's like the the cd comes out you listen to it and now it's on you now it's not on us we're not gonna tell you how it was made we're not gonna tell you where we were thinking with this it's just like it's completely open to the listener now you know and that's yeah what he thinks and i and i totally too like there's bands which you know you have to do this nowadays where you you have to release three or four singles before your album comes out now before you could you could you know not release anything and just be like fuck you this is the album you need you know he wants to hear everything yeah, and I, right. I agree with him like um i mean he's he's mm-hmm. pushing me towards this and i'm actually agreeing with him now where i you know the new single comes out and i want to hear it like i want to hear it right now i'm like fucking you know it's oh it's 9 p.m which is 12 p.m eastern time which means the singles on spotify now like i want to hear it like at 901 but um he's like no i don't want to fucking do not play that for me I want, I want the album to come out and i want to hear it in I'm a full like yeah, uh, we've construction. Had this discussion the, the songs aren't meant to be played individually the songs mm-hmm. if yeah. you're if you're if you've proven any you know weight and gold for for a record it's a record you're putting mm-hmm. a record out so yep. if you've got five, if you've like broken it down into fucking individual i don't like it either honestly i i, I yeah i've never been a fan of that i i, I want to hear the fucking record as it was meant to be <laughs> no mm-hmm. even if it's just a shit collection of songs from someone but if they don't have a meaning behind the record and it's totally. just a collection of songs i still want to hear it like that mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. It's, it's i think it's important it, that's it's almost like a lost art at this point now it's i don't put on i don't put i still don't put on to albums say. just to hear a song or two right it's, I'm putting an album in to listen to it front to back. And Absolutely. You, Mike earlier mentioned that you like the long songs, the 23 minute that right there. I was already going to try and bring this subject up of listening to a record front to back. Like that's Absolutely. not a thing that the newer generations do no, anymore. It's dude. a lost dot, man. It's a lost dot. I and think that's sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to no, interrupt, no, but um, I was going to say, I think that kind of separates pop music in a general sense from yeah. some of these other genres, metal, um, jazz, even, you know, like classical music, it's pop music really is this, it's industry based. And so you're going to put out singles that stand alone that make somebody a shit ton of money. If you can get really famous off of one song, they're not conceptually driven for the most part. There are those outlying exceptions, but for the most part, they're not conceptually driven to where it's an experience where it's telling a story and you have this immersion with this, this whole, this entirety. Um, Whereas I think, you know, the genres that we're interested in and listen to that we play, you know, there's the complexity and there's the story and there's this immersive experience where you can't really pull out one. It's like reading one chapter of a book. Yeah. Like you're not going to understand mm-hmm. the entire story just by reading chapter three. of the Yeah, I really book, like, you know? I really like exactly. chapter three and chapter seven. You know? <laughs> right. And, and then you think you understand the entire like character arc, you know? So I think like that's, that's one of the things that really you know i think if you're an artist and you're someone who really appreciates that about art in general the immersive experience you're naturally drawn to this this style of music because it's just you have to be active and participate in it rather than just like oh i'm gonna put on this song because it's a it's my little jam and i'm gonna move on with my day it's like no i'm consumed like i don't just listen to a nile song i'm listening to the whole fucking thing mm-hmm, because i want to yeah. be summoning up all kinds of egyptian gods and <laughs> lighting <laughs> exactly. things on fire <laughs> You make a yeah. you make a good fo- a point though because I think what where that comes from is like the point that you were kind of I mean the the correlation you're making with pop music I think it comes from pop music with the mm-hmm. the singles um, it's kind of like a it's it's more of a financial decision it's mm-hmm. not really much of a you know it's not like the artist probably doesn't want to do that but they want the most you know plays they want the most you know like buy or you know purchases they want to be on the billboard they want all these it's things short stories if we're going to use that book metaphor well, just, still do. yeah it just comes from the the model of pop music because pop yep. music has made the money well, and yeah. so there's the there's the baseline model of how they did it and then the metal record labels are like okay well we have to do the same thing now and it's kind of like because they're like yeah. literally with the spotify streaming thing there it's not one single album it's not two singles album it's like four singles an album like you know like well, they're like, be- 
because they want the hype they want the hype they want that continuous yeah. like it's that little bump on facebook they want they want those content 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 it's all yep, content. exactly it's all michael exactly. jackson what fault, happens dude. when you have an eight an eight song record you've already fucking shown half yeah. the records so. exactly <laughs> exactly oh, but and bad bad by michael jackson was the album that had like the most like singles from one album like hit singles like off of one i think it was more than thriller because there's only like they, fr- three back, songs on, Thr- on thriller that were like hits i think back then though they would just release probably or maybe one know. before they were like one music before. video before the album would come out you know what i mean and then they would be like single, single uh, yeah. yeah i think you're right oh no no it's post you know well, yeah, that, that post. was music video based and everything of course and when you like spend like millions of yeah. dollars on your music video it's gonna like you know yeah, I'm like a little bit. Like nowadays, they're just releasing all the shit before the release date. Like, I, oh yeah, that's yeah. No, I know. I know. Like, uh, I'm a big Leprous fan, and they're already they've released three songs now already, and they're probably gonna release another one. And then the album's coming out on the 28th. Like, it's like yeah, a lot of it's driven by those needing to uh, get yeah. those social media metrics yep. up, you know. And that's the way the industry is going, and it's. I know I, you know, I'm just dating myself here. And back in my day, we didn't have <laughs> social media like to this extent. And, um, yeah. you know, it's just it, a lot of it's driven by the industry's need to drive up those numbers, those like, yeah. kind of vanity metrics of Facebook likes and Instagram well, likes. And in order to do that, you got to have content. Well, What's the content? It's the music, you know? If, if you really, th- yeah, if, if you really think about that, it is, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, we, it's just marketing. Like, it's like, you know, it's like back in the day, like, people might not have bought the album but like the the video came out you know and even though it's already released you know they're like oh i'm gonna actually go buy that record or that cd you know oh that video is insane you know like whatever you know but now it's like like singles singles was was something that before all our times uh that's true yeah way it was done that was the way before yeah right right exactly yeah you know so it was it was really that that whole like notion of of you know uh, how the how the music industry works uh, it's been there from fucking from way back now and uh and it's now it's transformed into like videos and things like that and you know it's interesting i mean yeah yeah i mean i get what they're doing now i get what they're doing because i mean basically it's it's for for social media purposes it's basically record it's releasing four albums instead of one like you have four media bombs coming out boom like all like everyone check this out yeah. it's a hundred thousand whatever views boom check this out hundred thousand views again rather than just the album coming out and getting a hundred thousand views they could just yeah. these like these I big just, bombs you just made me could... think about the media cycle and how there's so much shit that just gets thrown at us every day that maybe that's like a strategic thing that to like oh, it is. make totally people is. not forget about the album coming up. Yeah. We're going to strategically get feed it into the media cycle yeah. at strategic that's times. That's hundred percent it for yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. social media is basically like just watching TV was back in the day. Like you're on TV, like they're just marketing. Yeah. You're, you're interacting constantly. with TV. Isn't that how like WikiLeaks did that shit? They had to like purposely, drop only like chunks because the media cycle so crazy that it People would have just, just gotten it because... would have gotten buried if they jumped it all at once yeah. yeah which happened with the panama papers by the way so that's what that they just dumped them all at once and then it just people forgot about it yeah people three days not, later not picked but, up as much on that but. but i think it's like also like like ba- back in the day it was like okay so television and like in the 90s that was like the best way to just receive media you've never heard like as far as like say mtv like in music like okay so a, a music video comes on i've never heard of alice in chains i'm like 12 or whatever and i see this video i'm like whoa what is going on you know and like that was like the way that all of we all watched tv we all had tvs on or maybe not but a lot of people did yeah. you know and so like but now it's like no one fucking watches tv like i mean i, I just watch youtube and like you know streaming like hbo and netflix yeah. bullshit and it's like I get all of my media, like, you know, from like basically Instagram and that's pretty much it and like things like that. But it's like, I'm going to hear about something that's like a single that's out that's marketing. I'm not going to hear about a music video that, it, well, not, yeah. at least on YouTube, but I'm probably not going to see it or watch well, it. Well, the point is like, I, I think is that the, the way that like human humans are now evolved with stuff is yeah. there's so much media so quick yeah. every day. 
Exactly. There's so many things. It's not just. It's an adaptation. It's, yeah, it's yeah. not like it's not like you're sitting at home and watching MTV and everyone's watching MTV too. It's like right. There's exactly. like there's like it's just yep. like laser yep. beams coming at you constantly and like it's de- right. it's dependent on what hits you. You know, it's yep. not like because we're that's how we're that's how we are now. It's like there's a ticker at the bottom with thirty thousand things going, and then there's the story <laughs> capping at the same time, and then there's also like a coming soon thing in the corner about another story. And there's like all these things that we've like, it's like a polyrhythm of like media that we're just like used to taking in now. Yeah. And we just forget about things so quickly because we get, we get swarmed. And I think like, how music, different- is, music is the most disposable fucking yeah. thing out there right now. It's, yeah. It's well, totally. Think how like insane, like how insanely different it is right now. Like as far as like, you could have like billions of people all listening to different music at the same time, but like all different music. Right. But like, if you think back when it was like MTV, it was like, oh, now you have like millions or wh- whoever many people watching Sitting like one, watching the, the same, same video. It's like Super Bowl, but like music, like all day, but like mm-hmm. Super Bowl style. Like it was like we were all watching MTV this video with my at the same before time. School. Always MTV yeah, yeah. or school. Oh, did you see that Toadies video before? Oh, yeah, dude. I was, I watched it. Before. <laughs> Toadies. Whatever. Awesome. Kingdom <laughs> Dog. Yeah. yeah. I just want to say, too, that um, along with, you know, the sort of, analysis of music coming out as you know uh part of the modern media landscape and how it affects uh how our attention spans are and shapes that there's also like new opportunities with the new uh medium and one is like every single gets its own artwork which is kind of cool and music is becoming a bit more visual again which is rad and so like for example my brother's doing the release a single like every two weeks before the album comes out thing and he's like Plug doing it. it. What, it, what and, is it? Oh, Elliot. Elliot OK is his band name. Um, and uh, yeah, so like every time it's like a, a, a art piece that he did is like part of the single that comes out on Spotify. And that's cool. And he like, you know, makes the art as well. So if like there are like ways to capitalize on it and make each yeah. release mm-hmm. its own artistic achievement as well. Um and that's just something else to factor in with all the other things we've mentioned too. I mean, you could think of it as like a, a three-parter, you know, Lord of the Rings movie or something. You know, like you're releasing yeah. one part, you got to wait for the, or the next one episode on Breaking yeah. Bad. You got to wait what happens next. You got to wait yeah. for that one. I mean, there's definitely ways. It's it's just different now, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. It's more we're like the our, ones us. who grew up listening to the albums front to back. And, yeah, yeah and I, I without the always, internet, and, there's always going to be from people who are into non-popular kind of music there's going to be a bit of apprehension about how things are in the pop world and then there's a lot of people who are kind of just in both and they like kind of see the pros and cons of both and they are happily existing in both where like i'm like yeah one day i want to listen to a 22 minute song and the other day i just want to like just scroll instagram and it's like fine to have kind of a balance of those two things i think that's how most people are so yeah that's also yeah. Dip- Go, go for it, Lindsay. Oh, I was going to say, I think it also depends on, you know, kind of your maturity as a band, like in terms of how long you've been around. If you have kind of a captive audience, you don't necessarily have to release these, you know, um, these teaser songs for your album. If you have like, if you're like Tool, like with their last album and you don't release any music at all, people are already chomping at the bit to hear it. That's great. Like you don't have to participate yeah. in this whole thing that's true if you're like an eyes of perdition kind of band we're just still coming up you know we need to make an audience and people mm-hmm. do not know what we mm-hmm. sound like so we had to play that game of okay well you know we're putting out an ep we have five songs we can put out one and we have to ride this fucking train until the until the ep comes out but you know it's just one of those things where you have to you know there's also that component where if you can afford it and and not put out any tunes until your next full album comes out because people are already just like ready for it you can do that but if you're a newbie like me uh with, with eyes of perdition you do mm-hmm. have to kind of you know lure people in uh with yeah. your content yeah, i would say that's totally like a lu- that's like a luxury now for for bands like that because i mean back in the day you had to get signed first mm-hmm. and then and then you get get to get heard. So now that's like, what this whole can... thing, this whole conversation is just us saying back in the day, dude. <laughs> you know, that's all it is. That's us yeah. saying back in the day. This is, we, this, is how was. this is how we still like it. We this is how we still like Cali it. Boomer podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it totally I, I, I have is, a dude. question for Lindsay, actually. I'm, I'm curious it. what you think of this. Um, if, if we're talking back to interpretation of, of music, um, just to change gears a bit. Do you do you hate when people ask you what the lyrics are? 
what they're about. Tell me yeah. what those. Yeah, are. I do. It's kind of, it's so weird because it's like, I, I like I like it. I like the I like the mystery, right? Because I know what they're about, and you know they're usually yeah. deeply you know intense, and there's a lot going on. But then it's like I don't want to like show the emperor behind the clock or whatever the analogy is like i don't want to like rip open the thing like for like eyes of perdition like i'm planning on putting out the lyrics i put them out for our first single um because i'm just actually proud of them but at the same time like once they were out there i'm like oh i wish i kind of just left it a little more you know because our song titles are ridiculous they're like stupid slam titles but they're like act the lyrics actually have meaning you know so i kind of wanted to just like leave it a little a little bit of mystery there but that's what I'm saying. Like that, that whole notion of that is, is, you know, it, what, what means something to you or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or to me or whatever mm -hmm. uh, does not necessarily mean the same to someone else who listens to it. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I've always run into people who have come to me and like o over the years and said, Oh, you know, whatever this song, or, you know, any song, dozens of songs. They're like, Oh, this song meant this to me. And it fucking had nothing to do with what that guy, <laughs> but who am I to say? Because that guy right. yeah. interpret or her interpretation was that's what they got from it. And that's what they felt from it. And I'm not, I shouldn't be the one to say, well, uh, actually it was. Uh, you got that part <laughs> wrong. No. Right. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's, no, I'm the same way. I like, I like to print my lyrics. I like my lyrics to be printed, but at the same time, like I want it to be up for the, I don't even know how many dudes, and chicks listen to death metal and actually read the lyrics too. That's probably a low percentage of people. And then the lower percentage is the guy who reads it and then says, Oh, this means something. Processes me. it and then becomes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's like that, that, but at the same time, that dude's cool, but I want him to just have it as his own. You That's gotta be this, flattering though for a vocal. I mean, for a, a lyricist or something. If if someone has turned it in their own thing, that's that's affected them positively or something. I think so. 100%. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. a lot of like I'll, I'll use Isaac Perdition as an example because a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is like about personal empowerment, and it's like it's pulling from that hardcore scene style vocal of really motivation and like PMA kind of shit. Really, mm -hmm. honestly, so you know, if someone is able to derive some meaning from that for themselves, that's awesome because, you know, that's what it gave me was like this boost of, you know, personal empowerment. So that's what the, the lyrics are about. So to that end, it's like, for me, that's, you know, if someone wants to read the lyrics when I put them out there and they take that and they fucking ride that to glory, I'm happy because that's the purpose of them. You know, exactly. I think there are some projects where the equivocation of things and the mystery without having the lyrics out there is a part of their shtick. Like that's just a part of their thing. It's like the mystery of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, if somebody like reads something that I wrote and they're like, wow, this has a lot of meaning. First of all, I'm like, you're lying. No, I'm just kidding. Like, <laughs> like no, there's no way. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But, like, if, they, if they actually, you know, if, they res if it resonates with them in some way, it's not really up for me. Like to Mike's point, it's not up to me to tell them, well, actually I wrote it and it means this. It's, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's like, once it's out there, it's no longer mine. Like totally. I may have invested a lot of heart and soul into it. You but, kept a version of it, but once it's out there, it right? Becomes... I yeah. For me, when I'm performing it, I know what it means to me. But once it's out there for everybody else, it's not mine anymore. It's going to mutate fine. once it touches more ears and minds. It's right. going to just mutate into different things. That speaking of like mutation and stuff like that, you're saying is that there's like been like I want to say I want to use Deftones as a reference, but. There's been times where I I literally because I'm I'm terrible at like hearing lyrics. I have to like go back and read what they're actually saying because I like you know especially when they're singing in different kind of styles and and they're and put deaf different, in one ear. And... I'm deaf in one ear. They use like a like different um like you know they emphasis on syllables thing. You know the different emphasis is um, on certain <laughs> words. They don't really come across the way that you know. So I'll, I'll sometimes with deaf tones. There's been a couple times specifically with them where i hear the words com words completely different and i make up my own lyrics because yeah. they're the, the lyrics that i'm hearing but they're not the lyric i'll read it and i'm like oh shit i was way off like but i turn it into something <laughs> completely different because it's completely different words it's it's completely like it's completely just not i think even everybody has a version of that even with like pop oh, yeah. songs that you grew up i with. do that all the time like, yeah i used to think of as give yeah. me the beach boys and free my <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. I was a uh, Aerosmith. It uh, makes sense, sweet- though. I want to get lost in your rock and roll, dude. <laughs> when I was a little kid, I thought that um, "Sweet Emotion" by Aerosmith was street erosion. <laughs> <laughs> I think it still makes sense. That. Well, I remember the, Chino that was a great example. I'm sorry, go ahead, Lindsay. No, no, please go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, Chino, Chino has, uh, he's got that crazy ability of like, sometimes you read his lyrics and they, they totally make sense to you. And other times you read it and I'm like, what the fuck, where is he going with this? Yeah. You know, yeah. He's, he's like a master at this like mystery, you know, hidden, uh, veiled fucking lyrics that, you know, I, there is no doubt that everyone who listens to it feels that it's, something else if they've if they've invested the time to, yeah. to read you know no and definitely that's cool you know i i remember times listening to um i want to say it was around the fur or maybe um maybe it was white pony and listening to the to, to the you know same thing sort of hearing something else and then going back and listening and then reading it and being like fuck man these are like <laughs> these are like intense fucking lyrics mm-hmm. and then literally the next day go back and be like what the fuck was I thinking here? Because I don't remember anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Fuck. <laughs> totally. Totally. I mean, that's just, you know, for me, like that, can't, I'm not a guy that can hear lyrics very well. It's actually kind of fun to make my own, what I think it sounds yeah, like. And should, just like, you should uh, write down some favorites, dude. All right. For us I, and read them out on the next episode. Yeah. I'll embarrass myself. I'll be sick, dude. Yeah. Just to for, the- for the pod. You should. To the singers and lyricists, do you ever write your lyrics thinking about performing them and how it's going to be singing them live and making sure that it's the kind of thing? I guess for Cloma, that's not really an issue, but with your other projects, no, maybe not for 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 Cloma, but but I I can I can safely say that there has been sections, at least sections, maybe not full songs, but sections where you know you 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 know that it's going to stir up the crowd and uh, you need to you need to put something in place that's going to be you know, drive, drive the crowd a bit more. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. And I think for me, um, you know, I, it, it's funny. I, I will write the mute. I will write the lyrics based on how the song makes me feel. So like if my band comes at me with a riff or like a full breakdown or something like that, how, what feeling is this bringing out of me? And then I write the lyrics to that so that when I'm performing it, it's so in alignment that it just creates this extra energy I've never really written any, except for like my electronic stuff. I've never really written lyrics by themselves without the music kind of in tandem because I just feel like they're just so inseparable. So a lot of what I write is, uh, you know, it's to emphasize or, or to kind of invigorate that energy that the music is bring, bringing forth as well. Oh, it, I mean, has meaning too. Like I'm not just, you know, like heavy, like writing words like this is hard, it's heavy, and that's the lyric yeah. or something, you know, but like <laughs> it has some <laughs> meaning as well. But I actually have a question for Mike. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're performing, uh, when you were performing Cryptopsy songs, maybe from the, from like uh, uh, the Lord Worm era albums, I guess to say, you know, were you like, when you were performing them, were you like interpreting the lyrics through like your own emotions and like performing them differently than how they were written? Or were you just kind of performing them the way that they were recorded and written originally? That's a good question. Um, you know, um, both. I think uh, uh, there's two sides to that. Um, did I did I take the the lyrics and and try to put my um, put my my own emotions into it? Perhaps not. Um, did I reinterpret them in terms of how how they were how they were vocalized? Sometimes. So there was a, there was a bit of a mix there um, in terms of that. I, you know, I remember like learning the songs and and figuring out parts that I could maybe um, give different accents to, or you know, try, try to try to extend maybe, or or uh, you know, certainly. I mean, you know, Lord Warm and I are different interpreters of of vocalization, right? Yeah. So the last thing I wanted to do was to sound like him, of course. Uh, and I didn't want to, you know, I, I don't sound like that. It's not, you know, it's not my vocal style. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I needed to, to adapt what my style was to, to how the old songs were done. Um, but not change it up too much so that it was the fuck's this guy doing yeah. like he's throwing the song. So, you know, it was, it was that like fine balance of, of trying to figure out where mm-hmm. I could fit my style in with, with, you know, with, with his style and, and, and try to, you know, enhance it as much as I could, you know, because those are, those are heavy shoes to fill. 
You know, you got a you you got a guy who's who's come out and delivered two unbelievable records. You know, vocally, I'm a huge fan. Lyrically, mm-hmm. the guy writes on another fucking level. Like, mm-hmm. So when you when you combine those songs and coming into that and, and, and trying to combine those two those two aspects, um, you know, I, I didn't want to sound the same, but I you know my delivery is certainly going to be different, but but I still want to try to keep it so that it's you know it's 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 still a cryptopsy, it's still those cryptopsy cryptopsy songs, but uh, but add my own elements to it. Yeah, I imagine it's just so challenging to perform you know, somebody else's lyrics with yeah. music that people already are familiar with. Like, I just feel like that would be so much pressure. You know? like, well, especially how unique Lord Worm was. He was not right. like a, you know, straight ahead death metal singer. He was no. something completely different. No, but you know, I, I think it helps that, that we were already friends before. So, I mean, it was, it was like stepping into, into a role where I already, you know, I already knew him. So it wasn't like I, you know, you, you, you speak of pressure, uh, Lindsay, but, that the, I can't say that I, I somehow I, I didn't, I, you know, I, I think back on it. I didn't have that pressure. I didn't feel pressure on it. I, I, I felt uh, empowered, honestly. I felt, uh, I felt like this was, you know, this was an exciting moment for me. This was going to put me in a situation where I could grow with the band and, 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 and deliver fucking great, you know, great albums post Lord Worm era. And uh, I just, I don't know, I felt, uh, I felt very confident and very um, in tune with what was going on. I, awesome. uh, I can't say that there was ever a point where I was like, ah, oh, fuck, uh, I don't know how this is going to sound or like, I never, you know, luckily, I, I, I don't know how, but I, I really was not there. I, my, my headspace was take the reins and go with it. Yeah. I had where my headspace was. I mean, I have to say that's what I love. I mean, Kurtopsy is like one of my favorite bands if not my favorite band of that genre like of all time but like I I what I love about Cryptopsy is like each era like epoch it's so different because Mm -hmm. each vocalist is so different that it's not like I'm not comparing like Matt to Mike or Mike to Lord Warren I'm listening to each album as like the standalone experience and that's what I love about the band is like it's not like you know Oh, this era was better, or whatever. It's like they're just different, you know. So they different, have yeah. different. We were just flavors. saying the same thing about Gorguts. What's up with Canada and making a like? We were using the what? What was the word we were using uh, earlier? Fucking ah, fuck it. They're 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 revamping themselves each album. You know, mm-hmm. they're mutating. Shit, they're mutating each album. And Such an interesting choice of words during this like whole <laughs> pandemic situation. Like, are we picking the word mutation just because that's like, like my, my, the my backdrop was, uh, of this reality right now? <laughs> it's like I, I like the Delta era of crypto. The Delta era. <laughs> I, I don't get it. I like, like the that non so vile variant, dude. <laughs> oh man. Uh, oops, we all start crying. <laughs> uh, I know. No, so uh, actually, yeah. to, to jump back on that, so you said that uh, Mike, that you were friends with Lord Worm and stuff. So I, I did some um, the other day. I randomly looked at your Instagram and I saw a, a picture. It was just, it was just you taking a picture. It's like you, like Luke LeMay and Lord Worm, just like having yeah. lunch or something. And I was like, I wonder what I don't know. Just as a you know, as a death metal dork, and and that's been my whole life for so long. And my and then you'll beg poster over in my high school room you know with all my other fucking death metal stuff like that was my main piece was the and then you'll beg yeah, fucking that. thing right over my computer just like when i was a kid and just i just was like it, it just seemed so nonchalant and chill and just had luke lemay just chilling back like everything's cool like eating a sandwich i don't know what the fuck he was doing but just everyone was just having <laughs> a good time you know everyone's just having a good time just hanging out like friends you know i just wondered what that like interaction was like that was <sighs> You know, I, these th- both these guys I love dearly. You know, um, they're they're top echelon people. You know, I uh, yeah. to have you know Dan I've been friends with for for years. Luke I became friends with on tour. We did two tours with those guys, and uh, we we became fast friends. Um, this was the first time I had seen him in a in a in a few years for those pictures, and we were actually doing a segment on. Um, I don't know if you know Cam uh, Cam Schwartz on um, the the, uh, the Growl documentary, the metal documentary, mm-hmm. no. putting together a metal documentary for like vocalists for uh, oh, cool. for 
for death metal. Okay. So what we did was we had uh, that was those pictures were taken at my house and it was the three of us getting together and we did really an epic interview. I, I, I say epic, I haven't seen it, but I was there and it was, uh, you know, it felt, it felt good. It felt wonderful, uh, you know, on the, on the moment. Um, but you know, those are guys that, you know, uh, Dan was here last week, you know, uh, we were sitting together. We were pounding. And Dan is uh, Lord Worm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Delete that too. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so Lord Worm. Yes, of course. Lord Worm. So Daniel uh, Worm came over. You know, and... So yeah, I, I have the Lord <laughs> in my house and uh, yeah. So, you know, I mean, these are, these are people that I, you know, I grew up with in the scene. I mean, I, I've known Luke for many, many years, even before, like we were, you know, before we had gone on tour, I had, um, I had been in, invited, I think during, if I remember correctly, I think it was before, before they released Obscura. We had actually recorded both, both that album and Whisper Supremacy in the same recording studio, almost simultaneously. And um, they invited me to come check out their, their jam space. And for me, I was like, fuck man, like, uh, Gorgas, I love this band. Like I've been following this band. I've seen them dozens of times before. Didn't really know anyone. And I just, you know, but they, they said, fuck man, we want you to come and check out the jam. I sat in their jam space. I watched those guys play that album from fucking from start to finish. And it's, it's otherworldly. It's, it's, it's something that you'll never forget, you know, and I, I, I will never forget that, you know? So it was, you know, there was, there was already a camaraderie that was, that was, was developing. And uh, over the years we've, we've become uh, very close, you know? And uh, like I said, I mean, I, I love those guys, you know, they're, I uh, would do anything for them. And uh, they're, they're quintessential pieces of Quebec death metal or death metal. Like let's face it. In like, general. Yeah. 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 In general, you know, and, uh, and, and to, to be able to, I'm very proud to be able to call those people, my friends, you know, like, uh, Fuck really. yeah, dude, I would be too. Isn't that what's cool about death metal and stuff is that like, you know, coming up from us playing our first tours and stuff to and to doing all the, the gnarly long tours and all the stuff, all the people that you meet. And before you know it, like your heroes are your friends. Yeah, man. And like you could just like text them and be like, hey, like, you know, what's going on? It's like and they respond to you. Name any other scene that allows that name any other scene. And exactly. I, I, don't think there is. I don't think there is. Yeah, exactly. That's always been like. You know, just like going up and meeting like Corpse Grinder and meeting up all these people like when I was a kid, just being like, that's like a fucking god to me at the time, you know, as a in yeah. high school and stuff and and just sit back and they just like want to show you stuff and talk to you about stuff. And you're like, what the f because you have to take a step all back. Nerds. I know. <laughs> we're just all <laughs> we really are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all just love music. We're all fans, we're all geeky nerds, and we just we like, you know, we connect on that level, I think, you know, and once you realize it's like your hero loves a band as much as you do and then you can start geeking out and it's like they're just another you know they're your friend now it's not we all yeah. got the same yeah. software upgrades yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that's a, it was like well, touring with suffocation that we did a few times like it would turn to the, the first tour was me like fawning and then second tour was like they're my friends and we're gonna go play poker together we're gonna hang out like they're like yeah. hey joel come over here blah, blah blah let's go fucking do this and that and you're like yeah sure whatever oh yeah I would have, I have to come back in my head and be like, you know, that that's like Frank and Terrence telling yeah. you to go do something right now. And you're just like, what the fuck is going it's on? It's such a trip, dude. I yeah. remember like when we first started doing the stuff when I was still just like a fanboy because I mean, I grew up on Suffo and just, oh my God, dude, it's like my yeah. favorite band. And so I'm like, you know, just like eh, like one morning we're like, I like, like one of the first shows and I just walk into the venue like to like find the bathroom or something. And there's Frank like right there and I just walk by him and, and he like recognizes me and he's like super cool. And he's like, How's it going, dude? And I'm just all like, fucking great, dude. What's up? How's it going? He says, it's going to be a fucking great show. And I'm like, fuck yeah. And I'm just all like walking, just like, oh my God. Dude. You go into the bathroom, like, <laughs> being like, like, what the fuck yeah. was that? That just happened, dude. <laughs> like, that was kind of like, like a, yeah, with cool Eric Rutan. Yeah. Like, Eric Rutan would like, he would like seek me out and just be like, Hey, let's go smoke oh, this Eric joint Rutan together. Is the chillest like, dude. All right, ever. let's go into a room you together. And, smoke and then you have to sit there and talk to him. <laughs> oh, dude, Eric is awesome. No, that guy. <laughs> no, I'm saying yeah. that because from that perspective of yeah, I'm about to sit down with Eric Rutan, and then you're already just oh. fucking blitz. Like screaming. I saw him play opening with Morbid Angel for Pantera. Yeah. You know, like I yeah. saw him play Walk with Pantera live in San Jose. Like, mm. come on stage yeah. and play Walk with Dimebag. Like, you're just like chilling in the small room with him, and he's just like, oh, Yeah, man, what's up? No, he just wants to hang out with you. You're like, Dude, He's really? the best. He's I mean, like, there's the always other cool people yeah. over here, too. You can hang out with them. But... I know. <laughs> we're, 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 we're actually very lucky in that sense of like, 
you know, you go on tour, you meet all these people, like you said, yeah. some of the people that you, you've looked up to for years and years and years, and you slowly or quickly become friends with them. Yeah. You know, and I, I think mm-hmm. of like, here's an example, like, um, you know, Chris Bonds, I, I toured with Chris Bonds, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Six Feet Under, right? Mm-hmm. This guy gets fucking trashed daily. Every fucking time I see this guy getting trashed. My personal experience with that guy is he's a fucking cool guy. Like, you know, like you, you're talking about like going to smoke with Eric Rutan. Like I remember being on the tour bus and like sitting in the front on the bus and like him and I just like fucking chilling and smoking and wondering like, where the fuck are these people getting this impression of Maybe they had terrible experience. I don't know. My oh. personal experience with those people. And I think in general, as musicians, our personal experiences with these people are mm-hmm. way different than the fans' personal experiences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know? So it's, sure. it's a yeah. different ball game. So when when I see people like fucking ripping this kid or you know or or, or you know yeah. talking shit about like past stuff that he's done, I'm thinking like man, I, th- that was like zero uh, experience of what I have with the guy. But like, you know, I remember like fucking chilling with him and like I don't. Know, he said we're all regular dudes, man. You know, or, or yeah. regular gals. You know, like we're totally. we're all just fucking trying to make it happen. You know, yeah. and and. Sure, some people, like, you know, we, we do know a few people, I'm sure we can all probably attest to a few people who let it get to their head, you know, but but in general, if you, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not about the ego here, it's about fucking... Mm-mm. Yeah, I think also when you, you know, when you're, when you have that touring experience and, and prior to doing all my vocal stuff, I did fill in vocals for some bands and I did lights and merch for many, many years. I went on tour with Cephalic a lot of times. You, you form nice. those relationships with people that are you you have that you know you're in that same i don't know that same world of touring and so you understand yeah. the stressors and you understand the realities of it you're so humbled by the realities it's like a, yeah. traveling, a traveling death metal camp like summer camp like pirates you're like pirates or <laughs> something is. you know yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. you just you develop that rapport with people because you're on the same boat and you form those relationships i mean i've met like so a good example is i went over to iceland my like one of my bucket list locations was Sofalic a few years ago and I met some really cool ass people. There's this Icelandic death metal band there um, called Affidian Eye. They're really, mm-hmm. really cool. Yeah. Um, that yeah. new so, record is fire. Holy shit. They're yeah. so fucking dope. And they're just really great people. And, you know, it's cool because we actually brought them out to play Denver Black Sky. Uh, the fest, I think, is Denver Black Sky, you know, to bring them out and like to play the States for the first time. And it was just okay. like, it was just fucking cool. Um, and then like, uh, you know, you just meet people throughout the world and then you just, you just stay connected with them, you know, yeah. and then, but it's under this very kind of obscene yeah. or absurd premise of touring like pirates around in vans and like not showering for days. Like, you know, <laughs> sorry, it's like you're sorry, on the same boat, you know? Sorry to yeah. interrupt, but like, dude, my friends have been like texting me about this Ophidian eye thing and you said it and I was like, I haven't, I've been working and then I came back and I haven't heard it yet. You guys were just was that the one that Josh sent? sent Yeah, Josh was sending it. Oh, I got that. Yeah, I listened to it. My friends have been blowing up my phone about this band. Like you just mentioned it, I haven't heard it yet. It's insane. I've been been working. I just haven't had a chance. It's It's really sick. I can't wait to hear it, dude. Yeah, I mean, like they, I think they've been around since like 2012, maybe. Um, It's crazy. Like I, I was a fan of them. Like like around that time and i just like mm-hmm. oh just iceland was just like this like random like i'll never go to iceland and so going sick. there meeting them and then like it was just you know and you built this That's report so cool, it's the dude. same thing of like having heroes yeah. or fans or whatever you know and then you're just like oh you're actually people humans who like do work out yep. on metal like me and then yeah you know it's <laughs> cool that's the ultimate lesson that you just you know it gets said so many over, so many times over and over. It's just like they're just people. They're just they're just you. They have their fans too, and like you caught on to them, and then you got into them, and then you like like put them on this humongous pedestal, going like, oh my god, that person, and then you hang out with them. It's like, oh, it's just, you're like me. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like yeah, you have so much in and common. They understand humans. that you they did the grind, and they see you doing what they've already done. So yeah. most of the time, guys will take you under their wing and give totally. you pointers, and and you know push you, nudge you kind of in the right direction. You know because that's all really you can do in that situation. Yeah, it's like yeah. for for us, it was Black Dahlia murder. You know, like taking us like. Uh, decrepit was not really much of a, a you know they've done one small tour but they were like we want you guys specifically because we like you guys as like your music and then we get to see a professional sold out tour as our first like major tour and it's just like every show is sold out like 
in advance sold out. It's a nocturnal tour. Like everything's like completely sold out. And then like we're just fucking frozen. We're like, Isn't what like what do we dude. do? Like luckily we got we were the opening band, so they let us like, you know, we got the the full sound check and stuff. So we got to have our all of our stuff ready with like the lights all dim on it and the lights would drop and we got to go pick up our instruments and go right on stage and not like have to sound check in front of people looking all like rookies or anything. But uh they they gave us a lot of uh, pointers and watching how they conducted themselves watching how their management conducted themselves and we we basically were just on oh. our like best behavior trying to like listen like okay uh yeah we'll we'll get off stage now or like we wanted to never go over our time get off before we had to get off like that basically just threw us into like a a boot camp but yeah it's and murray with the jersey that you're wearing murray took me under his wing as a yeah from severed savior took you know we immediately bonded and was like gave me all the tips like with you know on the more underground level what you do in the smaller venues and how you conduct yourself and mike gil or mike hamilton and, and stuff like that would just basically basically it's just all a brother sisterhood sorry <laughs> of uh of people just like basically you know going like all right fuck yeah you're doing it too like this is how you do it you know it's basically like uh you, you get uh, apprentices kind of like you're basically going into it and that's what's cool about this genre it's never been like a i've never been on a tour where like we're competing negatively with someone it's like yeah. we we sit back and we talk about what we did wrong what we, what we could do better yeah. um things like that it was never like like ooh, we fucked them up fuck them you know it's never like that it was always like unless they were dicks that's happened a couple times but um <laughs> and then we wanted to it does happen yeah then we wanted to just crush I think them. death metal is like a collective consciousness and mm -hmm. like we're just all striving to make death metal and extreme metal and all these different types of metal better than they are yeah here. Yeah, and exactly. the collective consciousness, you know, and more people get added, then the collective consciousness gets bigger, and we're all just in it to have a good time, dude. And all the bullshit gets pushed out real quick. Yeah, it, it's you hard know? to get jealous over a band that's like, it's like you're making four hundred dollars a night, and it's like, well, fuck them, they're making five hundred. Like, <laughs> 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 it's like it's really hard to get like really like. Whoa, yeah, bro. you don't get into death metal to make money. I mean, exactly. like, I I can't think of one person that's like, yeah, I'm in this to, to make it. <laughs> like, you to would, quit my, you my, quit my job. And, yeah, I'm gonna know. quit my job. Exactly. Yeah. We would not be in these stuff. bands if we uh, yeah. were in the shit for the money. We're in it for just making shit and collaborating with like-minded people. Yeah. Yep. And the collaborations for sure for sure i mean i get super excited about just like like just doing like one-off songs with people i really like uh my friend lucas is in this band called mastro and he does kind of gore gutsy crazy stuff just one guy in argentina making music and i was a, just yeah. mega fan and i was like do you want to do a song like i was just like he's like yeah let's do a song and it was just so exciting to do that and you know i just admire everyone for just doing what they love and putting their own spin on it you know like exactly. oh wow you know it's death metal quote unquote but it's something completely different than maybe what i would do and that's what makes me really excited about everything yeah it's the most like anti-ego driven thing it's kind of like it's not no one's in it for like a certain kind of monetary thing it's well, basically they, do, they love it there's a percentage of that are in it with, for the ego aspect. oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. i guess that for sure like but me it's, it's the I'm majority <laughs> the majority speaks like Humble, humble yeah, yourself yeah. and just fucking make dope shit. Yeah. Joel, who did you just name? I didn't catch that. Oh, I just said, I just said, like me. I was just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I thought he said Keen. I don't know. Oh, Keen? No, no. Uh, no. Joking, dude. I love no, Joel Keen. said me. No, I know. Keen's big old ego. Jesus, Keen. Sorry. Well, it kind of rhymes with me. Friends. That's all. I was just being silly. <laughs> I know. I was like, no, why did no one laugh? I thought that was funny. That's when I thought it was. So we're all like, yeah. <laughs> I, my uh, laugh just stopped all quick. Like, shit, did I fuck up? <laughs> I was laughing. My mic was just on mute. <laughs> I will say, I, I really miss touring. Like, just however long or however short a tour is, I really just miss being on the road and hoping things like are more normalized next year. But there's just something about, you know, performing live. You just can't, there's nothing like that in the world. If, whether it's in front totally. of 10 people or like a thousand, it's just, it gives so much meaning, at least to me, to the music that we make. Just having that feedback with the audience and people vibing with what you're doing. And it just yeah. gives it all so much more heart and passion. And I really miss that. I think that's the hardest thing about, well, besides, I don't know, all the craziness that's going on in the world. But one of the hardest things for me over the last year and a half has just been like 
I can't see my friends and not just like, I can't, you know, walk down the street to them. I really can't get on the road and travel to see people that I met over the last few years and reconnect with them. Cause that's really a lot of how I used to socialize was like being mm -hmm. on tour, like, Oh, I'm going to be in your city in a few months. Let's hang out or, totally. you know, Oh, you're coming here. Let's, let's, you know, get a, get a beer or something. And it's like, that just got taken away. It's so hard, you know? You know what's rough is hearing you say, and it's totally true. Um, because you know, all of 2020 we were going like, well, next year it's gonna it's gonna be, and then you said, and then you just said next year again. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> that hit and me I'm again. like, Dude, and I'm that, like, fuck. Actually, yourself, she's when she said right. that, I, I felt like, I felt it a little I literally hard. looked at the like, when oh, you said shit, that, I looked over at the side of my computer, looked at the date, and was like, oh yeah. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> we're just soon. barreling towards the end of the year, and I'm just like, fuck. I mean, and I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking at the stats and stuff of shit going up, and I'm like, it's like terrible. I like, I look at it and I'm like, it's that's not that bad though, right? It's like I'm looking at the graph and it's like, oh, it's it's the second worst it's been. Like, yeah, I mean, right out now, here right. in Vegas where I'm at, like, it's a fucking nightmare. Like, we're you know, because we're a tourist town and stuff is. I'm supposed to be going there in September too, and I'm like, fuck. I'm just gonna go. October, not <laughs> September, October. I'm going to Psycho Fest, and so is Joe. Joseph, are you still going? I got my refund today uh, but i'm buying one day saturday tickets well just letting all well, my friends know because i'm an idiot and i put in a ticket with them and i was like can i just refund one ticket instead and i should have just refunded the whole thing and rebought one but i was yeah. like just cancel one ticket and they just never got back to me and the, the, now it's past the fifth so uh -oh. i think i have an extra ticket for i sent my here. email today and i got an email today with the refund but it was for both tickets but i'm gonna buy both me and my partner two day uh, sorry, one day passes for Saturday. And that's just because that's the day with Dying Fetus, Cannibal Corpse, Thievery Corporation, and the Flaming Lips. Mm. And I don't really, wow. you know, the Friday yeah. day where Emperor is not playing anymore, I'm like, okay, yeah, like, I'm not going to go to the three day if Emperor is not. And now I feel like an day. asshole for going. Like, I'm seeing everyone, like, on all my, uh, like, Facebook socials or whatever socials in general, everyone's just getting their refunds and stuff. And I'm like, shit, like, people are texting me. I got three texts today going like, yeah not going not going not going i'm like so this is the only thing i was looking forward to so for, <laughs> for me less, like, a year and a half not to get into too much like personal whatever but i'm going camping for the week before so for me it just means an extra day camping instead of whatever yeah. so it works out but you know why i, I we're gonna party dude don't worry What's why up? are people backing out of it oh just the uh, the covid all stuff the international bands and international play. bands and the international bands can't get into the country like, um, watain mayhem satiricon Oh, which wow. I'm down to see, but you know, I mean, I yeah, I mean, there's still the roster's still really strong without yeah. them. I mean, I was super stoked to see Mayhem. I was really bummed that they can't play um, as Turcon too. But yeah. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people are nervous about the uptick in cases here yeah. um, because it is such a international tourist town. Totally. Uh, we're back to like mask mandates, one hundo. So you know. Yeah. I mean, it's and it's a festival, so it's not exactly like you can space yourself out comfortably. And it's super festival. cold there too. It's super freezing there, so <laughs> you can. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> there's that. Having a mask on in one in one ten. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, my god! Yeah, it's. I think it's still a hundred. It's like almost nine the here, and it's still a hundred degrees outside. So you Damn. were you you were there. And I, I saw your post about it, but I was reading because my friend was going there, and I was like looking at the weather in advance. And it was like saying like, oh, it's going to be 118 here this weekend. And then I saw your post. It was 117. You're walking around Vegas. What does 117 feel like? to? I mean, what does that feel like? I've been in one it's fucking insane. 111 or 112. But 117. I mean, it's probably the same. You, as it's that, like you can't. I don't know. It's like it's like, you know, that feeling you get when you open up the oven. When yeah. You're food, you're taking yeah. your boot out. Imagine yeah. that, but over your entire body. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Yeah, and and then there's a you know there is a breeze, but it's a hot ass breeze, so it's just yeah. like dragon breath in your fucking face, and and then you just can't. It's like like yesterday, I I had to go out to my car and I had to get a, a jump on my battery because it was too hot. My battery fucking oh, drained because it was that Jesus. hot, and I was standing there in the shade while this guy was you know luckily helping me jump my car, and I was just drenched in sweat just standing there doing nothing, and you just can't cool off. It's it's so hot. Yeah. I can't, if there's no other way I could describe it except when you like, you know, take your pizza out of the oven, just fucking feel that. And, but just imagine that all over your body. And then a breeze is like a hairdryer in your face. Yeah. So it's not <laughs> even like a comforting breeze. It's yeah. just like, you yeah. know, intensifying the heat. Um, and then the other part of it too, is of course the sun. It's like, if you can stand heat, it, the sun is super, super, super dangerous because you can get 
you can get overheated really quickly, even if you're outside in like a mister and you don't even really realize how much, how dehydrated you are because the sun's very intense yep. and I wear a shit ton of sunscreen. Um, I don't know. I still like beer. <laughs> I still <laughs> like yeah. the desert. I'm saying all this to deter people from moving here. Cause there's, I know, cause everyone's flooding <laughs> the right now. Everyone's <laughs> driving up the cost of living and I'm like, it's too fucking hot. You'll die. Yeah. Don't come yeah. here. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the Luxor. It's like actually like Egypt. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, like, like Egypt's colder than it is like in fucking yeah. Vegas right now. Yeah. Absolutely. I think in the valley, like uh, last month, we in the valley it was like 130 degrees, Ugh. like something crazy. It broke like a ton of fucking records. Like people were just like, I mean, no one really lives out there, thank God. But like it was, it was really. There intense. should be like more camels in Vegas. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm playing yeah. a show in Tucson tomorrow. Um, and I just checked and I'm like hoping that we like get pushed back to like 11 p.m. or so when it's, where it's like, only like 99. Where it's, I was going to say where it's like 90 <laughs> instead of 100 or something. Yeah. But I'm like thinking I'm like, all right, like I've got the songs down, like everything's good. What do I have to worry about? I'm like dropping my sticks because my hands are going to be covered in sweat. That's like, oh, yeah. how are you going to prepare for that, dude? I'm like grip tape. Can I, how many, <laughs> my car's full of drums. How many fans can I fit in my car? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> take with Jesus. Me, You're going to have to like Edward 40 hands, but just with like your drumsticks. Just, like, I was thinking stick. about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know that they're yeah. like the gloves, but then I'm like, that's like, I don't want to wear anything beyond, you know, I want to wear. Yeah. Less. Yeah. Your hands <laughs> are destroyed. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be heavy, dude. Um, that was just like, uh, I mean, we did one tour. I forget. We had this totally shitty van. We just bought our first van to tour in, and um, the air conditioner died right off the bat. And it's like one of the hottest like summers, you know, whatever. It's one of the hotter summers, and uh, we literally got to the point where it was like our our engine was overheating. So they were like, "We'll turn on the heater." <laughs> so we would be like in like 105, 110 degree weather with a heater on, going just driving with all the windows down. And we're just all in our underwear, just like. <laughs> We're all sitting there and we're I'm sweating, but like the 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 heat wind that's coming is kind of drying it at the same time. But it's like <laughs> it's like this weird doing. survival <laughs> technique that we can't we're just sitting there just going like oh, this is like a, a sauna, but we're like we're chugging much of water and just sitting there like naked, like trying to figure out like how to like that's you know, that's what we just had to do for the show. But we were like, Yeah, I mean, you get used to stuff like that. I mean, I lived in Sacramento for a while and it hit like there was a week where it was 110, you know, for eight days straight or something like that. And um, it was a nightmare, but coming from Santa Cruz, where, you know, I'm from, which is like the most temperate place in the United States, um, like our hot day today was like 75 and our low was like 61. Like, it's like, it's like, it's always like between those two temperatures. So coming from here, moving to there, it was the hottest fucking time of my life coming, moving back from there, coming to here, I was just freezing, like like 60 degrees like getting out of the shower i'd be like like shaking like thinking i had to go to the hospital like shaking like i was <laughs> yeah, like you had enough uh, <laughs> enough seasons up there that your body adapted to up there exactly it totally does it's true though you, you adapt like your body can't adapt like that's why people f figure out with vegas and that's why I'm, Vegas sucks. Don't go there, right, Lindsay? It's yeah, the don't go there. You're not gonna like can't, it. Oh yeah, but you can't <laughs> adapt if you go to Vegas. No, yeah. no, 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 never. Just one place only Vegas can adapt to. Only Vegas. <laughs> it's like the rule. Like when you move here, you never get used to it, so you might as well not come. Yeah, yeah what yeah. stays hot in Vegas is keep hot in Vegas. <laughs> Was that Mike? I said, forget frying one egg. Try two. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there was a a post on this uh, account that I follow, like some kind of Vegas something. I think somebody was like cooking cookies on their dashboard, to, like <laughs> one afternoon because it was so freaking hot. Jesus. But I mean, I saw, yeah, you ahead. do you do get used to it. I mean, like I I've, I've been out here since 2018, and I came from the LA area, so I mean, it's not exactly cold out there, but it's not it's not Vegas hot. Um, but uh, you know. You get it's used a couple to it. Years. Couple it's years. a couple years. You just speak, you know what? You figure out your lifestyle. So like, I don't go out walking the dog at 3 PM. He goes out really early in the morning or very late at night. I don't, mm. my day technically in terms of like, I'm going to go out and do stuff. Doesn't start till 7 PM. It's just, yep. you know, your lifestyle, you just adapt and, you know, definitely. There was a, a, I mean, we had a, you know, the first heat wave that hit the summer. Um, there was just like one account I was watching and it was showing all the like crazy effects that it had on things. And there was those fucking, you know, those waste management, whatever waste bins, those like blue and whatever waste things. They were just melting and just turning into like melting on the garbage, just like turning into this like piece of gum, like yeah. <laughs> like cars melting and shit. And I was like, and it was like, an, it was like Palm Springs or, or 
around that or a uh, death valley maybe and, but it was like just the full like all your shit was melting like your tires of your car were melting yep. like everything was just melting like <laughs> Your soul's melting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your life. Just like make it more metal. Your soul is melting in this hell that we live in. Um, yeah. I think the decisions the of club, living there. The leprosy melting. cover. That's your like the most. It's just melted off of your body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the most. Walking. That's the most metal weather report I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's melting. Yeah, they're like, oh, your soul's going to melt today. All right. Then they take it away. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, so uh, no, I, I mean, I love Vegas. That's always like, you know, you go there. It's one of those places where you go there and you're usually in a fun mood and things are festive and you're going there because you've been looking forward to it for a long time. Oh, yeah. We always and so people, I can understand why people flock there. And I've had so many. My uncles lived there for 40 years. I have like a bunch of good friends that have moved there. But um, I think and they end up kind of like saying they like it, but it's not like what they thought it would be because like you always go there on the strip when you're driving there, you fly in at nighttime and you're driving down the strip and it's all woo, like all like all the crazy lights and everyone's having fun and has, they have the big moose bones with margaritas in it. And they're just like having the best time they've ever had. But you know, you can only do that so many days. Like that's not going to yeah. last. I mean, probably I would guess, cause it's kind of like us with like a Santa Cruz with the boardwalk. We have a humongous or not a, a, a big theme park that's on the beach that everyone flocks to. Everyone drives hours to get to. I haven't been there in 15 years. Like, I don't yeah. go to those spots like uh, I'm sure like like Vegas locals probably kind of stick away. Yeah, from the, since the I've strip. lived here, I only go to the strip if somebody's coming from out of town and wants to hang out like the peripheral areas of Vegas are really beautiful, but they're incredibly suburban. Like, I mean, mm. it's just sprawling and it's growing, too. So it's really just the strip and then like downtown and little pockets here and there of things. But I mean it's it's what it is what you want it to be so if you want vegas to be party 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 you'll figure out a way to make that happen if you're here to just make a life and have chill time like me then you don't have to engage with it but it's very much like it's it's the straight up desert i mean like when you get outside of vegas proper and you go towards like Pahrump or like these other little peripheral towns it mm -hmm. is like they're like you know it is sprawling desert it's really beautiful it's great it's very isolating at the same time so, I mean, you can get out of it what you want. Um, totally. A lot of people, they're like, they're like, what are you, so you live in Vegas. Like, you just like, go to like, you know, sleep the club all the time. Like, like, no, <laughs> and I would die. I'd rather not ever go there. <laughs> like, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I uh, go to the grocery store and walk my dog and that's my life. <laughs> you know? Unless totally. Thunder from Down Under is doing <laughs> I mean, in that case. No. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. it. <laughs> I've told the story. I'll tell it real quick because you're from Vegas and I have to just say it real quick. So Psychroptic first did their first tour with us in America and they're from obviously Australia. And uh, we used to we told Bill to announce them as the Thunder from Down Under on stage. And they're like, cool, that sounds cool. <laughs> and like <laughs> and then I, I took them for their first little Vegas trip because we were at, we played a House of Blues in Mandalay Bay. And I was like, all right, well, we had, you know, we had all these people. Carcass was, I don't know, random bands were with us. And we were like, we all got this group of people and we were on that, that like tram or whatever that goes from like uh, uh, Mandalay Bay to Luxor, Luxor to I don't know something else, yeah. and uh, there was just a humongous fucking thunder from down under thing, right there. <laughs> and I was all, "Hey guys, it's you guys!" And they looked at, they're like, "Oh no!" <laughs> <laughs> uh, all male review. Said yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's go, brothers. Let's go. Let's go watch this. But uh, yeah, no, that's a uh, it's a fun town. But yeah, that's a uh, I don't know. It's like I anywhere else. Show was psychotic for the story, like dude. I went yeah. to Thunder down, <laughs> down under with the Thunders from down under. <laughs> we should have gone, dude. That would be great. I know, I know. So I will say that I, yeah. I am going to just put out a PSA. I would love it if more bands would route through Vegas because <laughs> it seems like everyone just like dances around. They're like LA, Phoenix, and they just like just don't come through Vegas. It's really hard to get bands to stop through here for some reason. I've noticed yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like a, a lot of tours, like. Um, mm -hmm. You know, unless you're like Slayer level, they don't really seem to want to play Vegas. And I don't know if it's hard to book here. We do have some good venues like uh, yeah. Triple B and like uh, Fremont Country Club. Uh, those are really good metal venues. So I'm just throwing that out there if the band wants to Well, play. I think the plus side, the plus side of uh, people flocking to your town, you're saying from you know California and stuff like that, is more population of people that want that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Like Sacramento got that. Um, a lot of places will skip san francisco now and go straight to sacramento yeah. they're like that's where oh, we're going lost now. it yeah because wow. now san francisco is all gentrified and a lot of people that are there you have to 
you know, rent for a studio is there 3,500 bucks a month. So a lot of people that are paying 3,500 bucks a month for a studio are not going to go to a death metal show. It's just, yeah, it's true. It's just how science and they're not a death metal it's, band. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's just what's <laughs> happening. So a lot of people are flocking to Vegas and stuff like that and Austin and stuff like that. I mean, Austin always had a, always had a good scene, but I think the plus side of people flocking to your town is that you'll probably see a lot more of those Enough shows. Ticket, through. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Just pros and cons, rent prices. Metal yeah. Metal. I, <laughs> I had to go I and know. check. I had to any, go and any check. US tour that we that we uh, that we had done. We never fucking played uh, Vegas. I, I, I've been to Vegas a dozen times. Never. Yeah. Played. Really We're, crazy. We got lucky. We got to play House of Blues and yeah, I played Bay like four Blues. or five times. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah like that was for fun. Was so we fun. had a good booking agent, I guess. Then, but all the shows yeah. were always really good. They're always. A, like oh, almost so just sold out like yeah. every time like it was awesome and just like had friends that like had you know like limousine companies and shit and just jump into limousines after we're done and like do the whole like girl at the top of the <laughs> roof <laughs> you guys have a, a day <laughs> off after do you guys have a day off the next day uh usually not so those were rough travel days but yeah. <laughs> i would but, think yeah. more bands would like ask to come through here for that very reason to like yeah I mean, why wouldn't you want to play hardy. Vegas? Yeah, yeah right. people, people. That's one of the most traveled to places in the United States. Like, I don't understand why that wouldn't be. Uh, maybe there's like a promoter issue with you know booking mm. agents and maybe some of the promoters in Vegas. I, that's the only thing I, I can like think of. We never play their own smaller tours, though. It was just like that yeah. one, bigger ones and stuff. You know, that like is true. Slaughter. I did like a I did a show there when we were doing like a DIY tour, and it was like just some like spray painted venue, just like mm-hmm. super DIY spot. And it was really fun. It was really hot and I bought pizzas for everybody. And then like the ants got to the pizzas before the humans did. (laughs) Um, But I'm playing the Fremont country club with uh, to violently vomit on October 9th. Oh, you're playing the festival. Sin city slaughter fest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Headlining. Hell yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're headlining and um, we'll have Diego Soria playing bass with us. Me and Diego Sanchez and AJ nice. Magana. I love Diego. I've known Diego for years. Oh, I love yeah. being from the San Diego. So he's a Swedish human being. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. That's the that's that's the project that's playing Tucson tomorrow, and then we're playing uh, just to throw it all out. Uh, Anaheim in September, and then Vegas uh, in October. So we've got a nice three three show three month little tour coming up one show awesome. per month so yeah. i'm still cool. waiting for one person in the whole death metal community to say something bad about diego i don't he think it ever oh, yeah. can happen he's the best person i know ever. <laughs> like every time person. his every time his name gets brought up like even on the podcast and stuff with all these death metal bands they light up They're like oh diego make sure you tell him how i'm, I'm doing or how make sure uh, i tell him what's up and blah blah and all this stuff yep. and i'm you know we got to hang out and blah and blah. I've like, totally, there's been so many people that have told me that and I haven't told Diego what's up from like all these people. I totally forget. Whatever, he's kind of our, he's our secret, he's like our, like our, one of we our gotta have him back on He's the spiritual soon. leader or like uh, spiritual guidance what, of the he's podcast. Our, he's yeah, the, yeah. He's, he's the, the whiz. Spirit guy. Yeah, the whiz. Yeah. He's the whiz. <laughs> the whiz. And he calls me the professor now, like, you know, so it's the wizard what's and the up, professor. Dude? Yeah. We, we tattooed that shit on you, dude. Yeah, I'm gonna get. With I'm it. gonna get 10, 11, 10, 14, 10, <laughs> 10, 1, 11, 10, 10. tattooed on me, dude. <laughs> no, but it has Inside to say jokes, 10, sorry. 11, 10, 14, 10, 11, 10. Shit. Shit. Okay. <laughs> sure, dude. <laughs> uh, sure, dude. <laughs> All right. So inside jokes aside. Um, <laughs> so inside it's, it's, inside jokes outside, dude. Get him yeah. <laughs> so um, what else? Do we, so you guys. I mean, does the band let's say next year have any like loose talks of like touring or like C- ccv or anything or is it just going to be a recording project is that is what it's sticking to or is there any kind of like talks about it ever being like a live thing i briefly broached this subject with gene and sylvia like, a couple years ago um i don't think it's out of the question that at some point if we had like the right opportunity and offer to like play a festival like as a one offs you know that we could maybe make something like that happen um you know i think logistically it's a complete fucking nightmare because we're coming from all corners of the globe um but i don't think it would be out of the question at some point i would love to i think it would be i wouldn't even know how we would i don't even know how we would practice (laughs) i don't even know how this would happen i would love to do it but it would just be i think the, the sincere challenge is the fact that the music is what it is and we have no, you know, most of us have never met. So it's, there's that um, complexity to that and then the logistics. But 
I don't think it's out of the question, you know. So basically what would have to happen, like realistically, is this next album has to do, has to pretty much get a bunch of attention. Then you guys would probably consider something like that, right? Like if somebody wanted to start like a petition online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we got like enough signatures and we felt the pressure. I'm sure we could. And then that. the government flies you guys down because you got petition signatures. and Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 all kinds of uh, I guess it's been a couple of years now, but uh, but but Drew from uh, Translation Loss Records had mentioned to me at one point it was the Philly uh, Beer and Decibel Beer and Metal Festival. He 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 had asked me. He said, "Look, if I I I, I can get you guys to to get on this, like, would you be you know if I, if I put the time in, would you be interested?" I was like, oh, fuck, logistically, I don't know." And you know, I mean, Gene Gene's you know Gene is the whiz of the of the project, so. So I, you know, I, I, I mentioned it to, to, to her and she was just like, oh, fuck, how are we going to pull that off? Like, so, it, you know, it didn't happen. But yeah. you know, there, there has been interest, you know, all that to say is that there are, you know, people have approached, it just hasn't worked out. I keep, uh, before I asked, asked that question, I forgot that you guys are like in like 50 different states. Yeah, international. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like seven countries in, in 13 states. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We're taking <laughs> over the world. We're going like, to yeah. add like four we other people. We have a couple people. camels also involved. Couple camels. Yeah. <laughs> One person from each continent and then like then we'll, we'll create a flag and then we'll yeah. create our own nation. That's the goal. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, I, personally, I mean, I, I've had I've had thoughts of like uh, for for thoughts um, from a stone. There's a there's a, this whole like chanting section that takes place in the song, and um, I, I, you know, I personally envisioned like having like a, a bunch of like shrouded people behind and like doing the chant behind this like project and stuff. Like, I mean, in my head, I'm there with with ideas, but I mean, this you know, logistically, it's, it's yeah. Nightmare, you know? It's already a nightmare if you have like one one guy that you're like in a California band and the one guy's in New Jersey or something. It's already kind of like a pain in the ass just for that. You know what I mean? So yeah, that yeah, that, that it, it would really have to be the, the right opportunity, the right offer to get us all in the same place, and then also to prepare for a live performance with the kind of music we do is like there would be a lot of preparation you know, plus yeah. logistics, but, you know, I think we would all be open to it if it was like the right situation and if we could make it happen as easy as possible. I just wish like technology was good enough for it's, it's still not there yet. Where like you could literally do this kind of a situation with zoom, yeah. but it would be like no latency. You guys could just all be in your own spots and just fucking yeah. do a live stream or something, you yeah. know? I, I thought you were that's... gonna say teleporting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, tele- <laughs> I mean, tele- <laughs> that's even more. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, teleporting to the screen. <laughs> we're not there yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just getting, the, yeah, get the Star Trek people together and just teleport. Yeah. Just like, yeah, yeah. No, that would. I mean, I think one day when that gets like solved, because I think because there's, you know, depending on whatever anyone's internet connection is, there's you know a little lag. And I've seen actually, um, uh, what's his name? I watched his fucking live. Uh, stream what's the dude from Fallujah Scott Carstairs Scott. Yep. um he had uh we had anomalous on and then the next day they had he had anomalous or uh Max from anomalous on and he did a straight jam with them he played some but he played some like really kind of spacey chords they were kind of slower chords who had him on uh Scott from uh Fallujah had uh nice. Max on the next oh, day yeah he plugged that didn't he? yeah talked about totally. that. yeah I watched it it was sick yeah it was super yeah super fun to watch and they were just super engaging and had a good time it was like a really good time but they literally at the end of it they're like let's jam and they and scott did some chords and dude and max just started like soloing over it and it sounded mm-hmm. good i was like all right well this is like that's the future you know especially with you know post pandemic shit that we have to deal with and pandemic stuff like i think some things are going to come out of it that are really going to help the music industry like with, you know, the live streams have been really cool and and stuff like that that people are doing where you might have a situation where you guys can't tour or, you know, so-and-so's got, you know, the main guy's got a job where he works, you know, nine days a week and can't do anything, but he get a day off to, to stream or something like that and get everyone together, fly out for one show, show everyone and then just take off. You know what I mean? So hopefully uh, in the situations that you guys have or other bands that are kind of globally you know, distributed bands that we, there's other ways to show off your music um, that are more, you know, through the through the eyes of technology, perdition. That would be the cool. eyes of technology, perdition. 
<laughs> Sorry, I snuck that. It was a good try. prediction technology. It was a good try. I admire the effort. <laughs> but also, um, I want to actually ask you because I don't know if this has been brought up. How did you get linked up with the Eyes of Perdition guys? Oh, um, I when I first moved out to Vegas, I was actually just intent on starting a band, and um, I don't know how this actually happened. I think I ended up friending Chasen, our guitar player, on on Facebook. And he had posted something like he was starting a new project looking for a vocalist. Like it was that simple. And then I just hit him up. I'm like, Hey, I just moved to Vegas. Do you want to, you know, hang out, talk project, whatever. So I just went to their practice space. Um, and they were just, you know, we were actually the, the early iteration of the band. They, they were doing a lot more kind of death core, even a little bit of metal core kind of stuff, but we quickly sort of blossomed out of that into the slam area and kind of more beat down. Um, and we, really started playing like live in 2019 and like July, 2019. I have a funny story about that, but like we, we were actually a five piece. We had a, we had a dedicated bass player at the time and two guitar players, Jason and Terrence and the Dakota on drums and me and vocals. And we played our, fir our first show ever July, 2019. And um, our bass player, before we even got off the stage came up to me. He's like, I'm quitting the band. I'm like, what? Like, he's set. like, he said, he, he was like, set. He's like, the music is too hard and I don't want to do this anymore. I'm like, can you, at least, can you finish the set before you quit the band? Yeah. Was it mid set or pre set? <laughs> I think it was like before our last song or something. And you oh just kind of, I was like, God. the fuck? <laughs> um, so, but that's that's actually the story as to why we have Chasen and Terrence switch off instruments mid set. Because um, people have commented on, they're like, why do you guys, why don't you have one play bass, one play guitar? It's because they're both very, uh, skilled and talented guitarists and bass players and we're like well we don't want to invite in another chaotic member so we we're going to keep it a four piece and yeah they just literally switch instruments mid-set and it's just kind of our little stick i suppose but we haven't been and, you know we haven't been playing together for super long but um i really love what we're doing it's just we just have so much fun and it just the synergy between us is really like super healthy and very creative and it's been a while since I've been in a project besides like CCB where I've really both admired the people that I work with musically, but also really like them as people, you know, it's kind of yeah. hard to find sometimes. So I think uh, we're, we're going to stick to being a four piece. Plus it's more space yeah. in the van. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's be real. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So as far as uh, for Mike with you and I on what's going on with them, what's up in that camp. You guys got a new beer, right? Yeah, we, we, we do. I, it's still not out yet, but we have oh, coming coming soon. Yeah, uh, you know what? I think it was uh, maybe I'm overstepping my my boundaries here, but um, I, I think there was a mess up. Uh, well, I know there was a mess up with the with the beer. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if it was scrapped, um, but it, 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 it seems that you know it's been it's been a bit of time now. Um, I, I was told it was still alive, and it's. I mean, I'm I'm hearing it's supposed to be canned in the next couple of weeks. Okay. So hopefully that's that's still in line. Yeah, I just remember seeing you guys on that list that of all the bands that that was for. Yeah, it's with uh, Brewski um, uh, Brewery. They're uh, they're they're fun. these guys are like the elite in terms of uh, Montreal uh, brewers. I fuck worldwide. Like I mean, honestly, like you, these guys, like uh, they have a stout that's a um, it's a um, fuck is it it's an imperial um shit what is it it's a um it's a brownie it's an imperial brownie stout it wow. tastes like you're drinking a brownie like literally so they somehow they've incorporated the the the, the flavors like uh like impeccably and um yeah. so our beer is supposed to be um it's supposed to be a coconut chocolate um coffee stout Nice. Um, Honestly, I'm dying at, uh, at like I think it clocks in at like 10.5. Uh, I'm I'm quite excited about uh, uh, about this. But uh, <laughs> you know, in terms of the band, I, I think it's you know I, I think it's safe to say it's a it's a one one album project. At this yeah. point. I don't I don't know that it's going to continue beyond this. Um, but who knows? You know, like uh, I'm moving back to the states, so we well, are. Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm at the oh. end. Of, I just sold my house. So, wow. uh, back welcome to the back, school. dude. I'm back in, man. I'm back in after 26 years. I'm back in. 
Wow. And first time on Cali podcast that I'm talking <laughs> This is an exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going everywhere. Housewarming party for Mike. And Joel <laughs> missed it, so we're not telling him shit. Like when I uh, <laughs> You're out. It's all good. <laughs> no, he's coming back dude. to the States, dude. Yeah. Oh, nice. Back, yeah. Back, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I thought you were already uh, in the States. I thought you were already in Massachusetts or something. No, I mean, that's where I'm from, but uh, I've been in Quebec uh, for 26 years. Oh, fuck. Keep up, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> only, th- only three decades? Whoa. <laughs> only three decades. <laughs> only like more than half your life. <laughs> yeah. More than half my life, literally. So moving back oh, to uh, to the States is, a, you know, this is a huge move, man. It's, um, which state, uh, if you don't mind disclosing? Which state? Yeah. Initially, I'll be back in Mass, and then I'm, I'm going to buy a property in uh, New Hampshire. Nice. 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 Yeah. I mean, speaking of like housing costs, like Mass, that's not cheap in Mass, right? Or New Hampshire it's either. Possible to buy, like uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I've scoped it out, and it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, quite honestly, I want to. I, I like this the, the the notion of seclusion and yeah, a lot of land, land. And, yeah, you know, big fucking big home, big property with yeah, mountains and forests, and that's what I'm totally. all about. Sounds yeah. like fucking the shit, dude. Yeah, That's man. exactly what I'd love, dude. I'm ready for that. So you know, this happens at the end. At the end of the month, I did. I sold this place. Like, I'm, um, I'm out awesome, man. Congrats. Wow. So hopefully, I'll get to have that beer before we get before I bounce. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, dude. So, <laughs> I'm oh, told yeah. it's coming. So hopefully, it'll. Oh, uh, well, just put put your forwarding address there and just get it a couple <laughs> months later. Um, yeah. <laughs> What did you I, most like about living in Quebec all these years? There's a lot. Um, the opportunity has been amazing for me. Uh, the people. Uh, I have forged a tremendous amount of very strong friendships uh, from mm. here. You know, I was. it's funny. I was just talking to my mother about this, is that when I moved from the States to here, I had forged friendships on, on, on the large part over like, let's say a six, six year period of time, let's say from 18 to 24 when I moved up here. And those friendships have remained, you know, and there's awesome. the earlier ones, of course, too, you know, like uh, obviously I've had like lifelong friendships, but, but in general, it's been that sort of frame of, of time. Mm-hmm. Being here, I'm leaving 26 years behind of friendships and uh, uh, damn. brutal. Alliances and you know, I mean, it's it's you know, it's it's a lot different this move than my initial move up here. Okay. Um, Beck has been very good to me. Um, there's there's there are things I don't like about it, but but by and large, I I, I would say it's been an absolutely awesome, positive experience. And nice. um, and it's it's uh, I'm torn because I'm happy to be going back to live with my family, you know, be with my family and friends. Uh, you know, some people I haven't seen in a long time. Um, but but I'm you know I'm I'm leaving behind a a, a large set of, of friends and fellow musicians and mm-hmm. people I respect and you know it's 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 that duality of excitement versus a sadness, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Totally. What what part of Quebec were you in? I'm outside of Montreal. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so west, did... actually west of Montreal. But I mean, I you know, Montreal, west of Montreal. It's yeah. It's been my place, you know. Like uh, I, I spent a lot of time in the city, you know. Yep. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people I love here, you know, and uh, you know, to to leave them behind, to take the chance. I you know, I I can't I can't take a chance with with not being able to cross a border. Mm. they've done you know the governments have done it before they've shut down borders i don't want to be in that situation to not be able to see my family it's been two years yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. so uh, i i it's it's the right time my wife has been you know she's she passed away three years ago Mm, there's nothing tying me here like 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 it was you know i i I had no intentions of leaving this place this was this was home for 26 Mm. years and you know and uh but but uh, i think you know, the last three years have have um, have given me the opportunity to finally say, you know, it's time. It's time to come back. Yeah. I, can, I mean, I can't imagine like the, the 26 years of friendships and stuff like that. I mean, 
even for me living in Sacramento for four or five years, like, and come and leaving that, you know, for, and it's, I mean, it's only like three or four hours away, but still like, that was like, I was finally tied in and everything was like, I had my friends, I had my, my groups of people, I had all those folks. And, um, I basically got the opportunity to move back to my hometown, which is a beautiful area. You know, it's like one of the most beautiful places. And, and Anthony can attest that, you know, Pacifica too is one of the most, you know, amazing Hawaiian, whatever. You're just like it. in paradise that everyone wants to come and, uh, and had, you know, job opportunity mixed with that. It, it's, it was basically a perfect concoction for me to, I, I had to, you know, to leave. And I was, I was uh, just finally comfortable. I was like, I fucking love this place now. And I'm like, now I have to leave. But, you know, I, there's you know so many people that I'm still going to be in touch with and that we'll all be in touch with for the rest of my life. But yeah, you'll never sometimes. lose that. You'll never lose that. And I can attest to that, you know, from from the move to, you know, from Boston to to here. All my Definitely. friends from back then, I'm still friends with. Like, I mean, you don't lose that. Like, yeah. you're either you're friends or you are not. <laughs> it's it's yeah. really yeah. that. They're acquaintances or they're friends. And the friends remain. And family, of course, remains. <clears throat> but uh, but the, yeah you know uh, look I'm you know I'm an, I'm an emotional guy like uh, in the mm. 26 years does not lend to a easy transition for me to totally. buy anything you know um, but yeah. uh, you know I I, I the, the the people the people that I've you know that I, I consider close friends and even some maybe peripheral friends I know that you know I'll see them again I know that they'll come down I know you know so it's not and you got shit like this. on one side. I know that it happens, you know. So yep. I, I hold on to that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, that's cool. There's nothing, you know, that can never be changed. And sometimes life is life, and you got to do your thing. You know, it's basically, it's basically how everyone, you know, especially now, like nowadays in California, like so many freaking people have bailed, like, and moved. Yeah. You know, like from I moved away from uh, from Santa Cruz for one year in 2011 or 10, something like that and came back and it was like the same i left in 2016 and came back in 20 not, end of 2019 and it was completely different it was yeah. like mm. like things that everyone had bailed everyone had left it's you know the housing costs like even during covid here like ho- housing costs like our like your mid-range like house here your middle of the range house here is 1.2 million dollars wow that's your middle wow. one and i'm living in a fucking amazing humongous house right now just because of people i know it wouldn't, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these communities where it's about people that, you know, it's never like, or unless you're making, you know, a, you know, 600 grand a year, something like that, you know, it's like, there's no real in between you know, with that. It's gotta be like, so it's, it's a tough place to live. And, you know, the writing's on the wall that, I mean, I, luckily my, my dad bought a little condo here a long time ago and there's a possibility I could stay here maybe like long into the future, but man, it's like, I'm looking at co- like cost of living. If I had to like find a place, you know, and I make a good living right now, I still would probably be like, you know, it's like four grand for a month for something like kind of mellow, like a small little place, you know? Yeah. It's, it's that like, was it's my, a... my challenge was I lived all over California, lived in the Bay area for a while too. And I mm-hmm. had to bail because, and this was back in 2014, maybe 20, mm-hmm. 2013, 2014, I was in the Bay area. And I remember I was living, I was living in South mission. I don't know if you're like familiar with, San Francisco, San Francisco was yep. in the mission. Yep. And I was looking for like a new place to live. And people were renting out their walk in closets as like, you know, for like $900 a month as like, you know, like a living space. And I was like, it's time to go. Like, yeah, it's just, yeah. It's not sustainable. It just becomes and, laughable. It's just yeah. like you look, you look at the ads and you're like, is that that's for real right now? Right. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. yeah. <laughs> One time uh, I, I tried to get a place like in the, like, basically the basement like laundry area for this dude's place like like in the sunset of san francisco because i've worked there for like a long time and dude it was like insect ridden spiders like not like so disgusting like so bad it was like a thousand or like 900 something is so fucked up and i was like i signed the thing then like i got like checked it i was like dude i just got out of it like so fast you know yeah well that's it i'm looking at these properties up here and uh or mm -hmm. down down there yeah you know, it's not it's not cheap by any means, but I mean, I'm looking at like you know, let's say four to six hundred thousand, and yeah, it's reasonable. These places with a shitload of land and yeah. like seven fireplaces in the fucking house, like these. Mm-hmm. Old, old, old. Yeah, like you have acreage now. <laughs> yeah, that really speaks to me. You know, 
Totally. And, uh, mm-hmm. for, for me, you know, like, you know, I, I've, I've been very fortunate up here and, you know, I have a beautiful house here. And yeah. What are, what are yeah. the weed, what are the weed laws in Massachusetts? What's that? What are the weed laws in Massachusetts? I think it's open. Nice, dude. Yeah. Get some plants going Ooh. on your property. It's not the <laughs> south, you know. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. New Hampshire, live free or die. So. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. Well, you know, congratulations on that that change, man. That's gonna be a big deal. Yeah. And, Thank you. Um, yeah. Hell it's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be hard emotionally and positive emotionally and yes. all everything in between and. Yeah. You'll you know everything always works out. It's just how it works. You know. Great. You know. Yeah. Whenever you go into those kind of ventures of uncertainty like you'll end up on top it's just how how life has a way to do especially when you have good intentions and and it just seems like life always kind of has that that way of just making things you know i mean you start looking at the everything happens for a reason thing and you're like maybe it's kind of true you know it's like it's maybe our, of a, our dreams of ccb playing live are a little bit yeah. closer now that you're here <laughs> i know <laughs> right at least four, like three of us are in the same country at least four of us are like 10 country. continents in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the same country now so you guys can be in the same you guys can be in the same room and then you can just have like three laptops for the other members and just like put mics to them and then <laughs> yeah <laughs> cardboard yeah. cutouts of jeans. that's right yeah. <laughs> uh well fuck yeah i think it's uh i think we're gonna start wrapping this shit up but yeah. dude thank you guys so much for fucking coming on i fucking Lindsay, so fucking fun. you're yeah, the you shit awesome. mike oh, yeah. i love you fucking oh, yeah. you guys have a yeah, big thanks for coming on again mike yeah man yeah. Love you guys. yeah dude awesome thank you so much for the opportunity dude, honestly always oh, yeah. hey, you know what at the bottom at, 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 at the end of this i finally get to see speak with Lindsay. for god's sake Yay! Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, dude. totally bring it awesome. to Kelly podcast bringing people Hell together yeah. we'll, we'll hang out for a little while afterwards exactly, too if you guys, yeah. if you guys want yeah, to do yeah. like some and like Wrap use up. like f words and stuff i'm just kidding <laughs> but we'll um the, we'll have a post pod for sure it's post gonna be pod. good post pod yeah totally um oh, well, are we yeah. not able to say the f word did i miss that memo no you can say <laughs> the f word no, no. say, it, Lindsay, <laughs> say it right now say it right now Fuck! I, like, oh, yeah. I wasn't Whoa. like. Whoa. Whoa. Start over. Whoa. We got to start something the over. Children, what will the children? God damn it! We got it this far. We got to retake it. Dude. I'm like, did I miss that memo? It was that kind of podcast, or we? <laughs> so. We're super. Okay. We're, we're live in Nickelodeon Studios right now. So. Oh shit! <laughs> Streaming live on Disney <laughs> right now. Yeah, we're on. The All right. Uh, well, thanks guys so much for coming on. I had a blast, and thanks to all the listeners, subscribers. Um, Love you guys. Uh, Cali Death Pod or CaliDeath.com. Go check that shit out. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, SoundCloud, all that shit. We're, dude, uh, we're so cool, dude. So cool, dude. <laughs> Make us even out, cooler dude. and give more uh, thumbs up and likes and subscribes and all that shit. <laughs> yeah, dude. We'll be back next week. Love you guys. Have a great one. We need to drink more. Cheers, guys.